Buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Eh, bienvenidos a Mellalas Matadero. Gracias por acompañarnos en esta tarde. Eh, muchas gracias al equipo de Mellalab, al equipo de Matadero, a los equipos de audio y de música que van a hacer posible este evento. Gracias a Intermedia que nos ha cedido este alucinante espacio, eh, barra exposición, vaya, barra dispositivo. Eh, el idioma del evento de hoy va a ser el inglés y un inglés avanzado. Eh, vamos a hablar de temas muy científicos, muy elevados, por tanto, quien no se sienta cómodo, tenéis la oportunidad de, en la mesa de la entrada eh, coger unos cascos y de esa manera enteraros perfectamente de todo lo que va a pasar. Gracias, por cierto, a nuestras traductoras. Eh, y ahora cambiamos a inglés. This has been an intense, exciting, thought-provoking week. We had three round tables. We watched two movies, thanks to Cineteca, by the way. Ex Machina by Alex Garland and Arrival by Denis Villeneuve and we had uh, long dialogues about them. This is our final session for this program, Cosmic, Cosmic Brains. It will run from six to nine and then at nine, quarter past nine, we will have a musical performance over there. So please do not hesitate to stay after the conference and we'll enjoy a musical show over there. Um, without further ado, I will introduce you to Ed Keller, who is the curator and soul of this project in a way, and who will lead you through our day of inspiring, uh, thought-provoking uh, amazement today. So thank you very much, Ed, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Check, check, check. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you so much to Matadero, to Eduardo, Javi, Elena, everyone here. Incredible experience being here for the week and can't wait to come back in January and February for the conclusion of Lab 3, Synthetic Minds. So welcome to the symposium. As Javi said, this concludes an uh, intense five-day immersion with a really amazing group of people. And uh, I'll read you a, a kind of a formal statement about what the brief of Cosmic Brains was and uh, it'll give you some idea of what we're going to talk about tonight and what the structure of the week was. We tried to bring together cutting-edge minds working in science fiction, philosophy, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, the arts, and design so that we could have a sustained interdisciplinary conversation. In some cases, these are friends and colleagues that I've known for more than 20 years. In other cases, it's a group of people who have only met each other for the first time in the past few days. We focused on pivotal questions concerning AI, AGI, artificial general intelligence, and the alien. Um, some of the themes that we looked at included whether alignment and communication with artificial intelligence are feasible, whether the boundaries of language and mathematics and logic and AI development were the right path to follow. We explored the deep time of the evolution of human sapience across millions of years as a kind of a framework to consider what it means to design artificial intelligence today. And we searched for parallel models from evolutionary history to understand how they could assist us, what it would mean, the, uh, the kind of, um, uh, the, the way they would function as models, not only to understand the emergence of biological intelligence, uh, but the way that we could use them as, uh, as kind of templates to design artificial intelligence. We talked quite a bit about the idea of multimodality, not just language and image, but sound and gesture, synesthesia, and the synesthetic and embodied approach to cognition. Gesture was a very important part of this, uh, of course. We asked what it might mean to imagine and design micro-worlds and pocket universes. What does that mean? Well, a micro-world or a pocket universe could be a toy world, a simulation, um, even a very reduced simulation for artificial intelligence to live in and grow in. We also imagined this idea of the micro-world or the pocket universe as an alternate pathway or a sanctuary in the eventuality that alignment with artificial intelligence and the alien might prove elusive or even impossible. So again, we have had this fantastic program, three-day symposium, um, each day, four hours and more of conversation, presentations. Uh, then, <coughs> excuse me, outside the symposium, two film screenings, Ex Machina and Arrival, which were both chosen to deal with the concept of non-human cognition, communication, and of course, alignment. We talked about evolutionary pressures on intelligence, gestural ecologies, the temporality not only of language but computation and cognition. 
and the ways that soundscape and music and multimodal information flow could become something like an ecosystem model of mind. And during the workshops, again, we, we tried to jump in scale, literally from the concept of a single living cell having perception of the world and possibly sentience or awareness of the world, to an organism, to the scale of an ecosystem, to the scale of the planet, the solar system, and indeed a universal set of scales out of which uh, intelligence and cognition might emerge. And we asked what conditions are necessary for cognition to emerge from? What were the conditions that allowed us to emerge as sentient and sometimes sapient beings? What kinds of non-human minds here on our planet, what range of minds can we identify? And what alien minds can we prepare to encounter? Might we imagine? And crucially, again, this, this conversation kept coming back to the question, how might these ways of thinking about mind, about computation and cognition, apply to the project humanity has now taken on to design and engineer artificial intelligence and artificial life? So, fantastic week. We were joined by a range of guests. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you who some of the guests were, and then I'll introduce our keynote speakers for tonight. Sarah Walker joined us. Benjamin Gertzel, Carla Leitao, Gabriel Montez, Elliot Sharp, Bonnie Bursaden, Troy Theria, and Michael Garfield. People working in astrophysics, artificial intelligence, architecture and design, new media, neuroscience, music, philosophy, the politics of new media, new forms of ecosystems and health, and uh, what it means to think radically across all disciplines. So tonight, we're going to have three keynotes. Peter Watts, Nandita biswas Malamfi, and Julieta Aranda. We're also going to welcome two guest panelists tonight, Benjamin Bratton, who's joining us via Zoom to speak with Peter, and David Roden, who's here with us, who will speak with Nandita. And then our final discussion will bring all of us on stage, uh, David and myself, Peter, and Nandita, to speak with Julieta about her work. And, uh, and hopefully we'll have time for some conversation with you. After the symposium, as Javi said, we'll have a, a very short post-event soundscape improvisation, which will be a trio of myself, David Roden, and Alvaro Domain, who's joining us via Zoom from New York. Uh, it's going to be an experimental real-time AI generation image running in the background, responding slowly, but responding in real-time to gesture. And the ensemble has met four times during this week with various guests joining us. Alvaro Perez joined us uh, a day or two ago, for example to improvise, to think about what the framework of improvisation and gesture might be in music, and to explore sound as a possible channel to connect to artificial intelligence. So this is a, a very quick introduction to what our week was like and to what we'll be doing tonight. The format tonight, I'll introduce each guest speaker and their guest, their conversant, before their talk. Uh, then we'll hear from our, our speaker and the respondent. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next, the next speaker, the next keynote. We're starting off tonight with Peter Watts. Peter Watts is a former marine biologist. He's an author. He's the survivor of flesh-eating disease. And despite an unhealthy focus on space vampires, his work has become required reading for university courses ranging from philosophy to neuropsychology. Indeed, one of his novels, Blindsight, I included in my syllabi for more than 10 years. His work is available in 24 languages. It's appeared in 34 best of year anthologies and has been nominated for 59 awards. His list of 22 wins includes the Hugo, the Shirley Jackson, and the Seyon. He lives in Toronto with fantasy author Caitlin Sweet, a placostomus the size of a school bus, a fantasy creature perhaps, but no, I learned it isn't, and a dynamic assortment of mainly feline tetrapods. And the respondent and conversant with Peter will be Benjamin Bratton, Benjamin Bratton is a writer whose work spans philosophy, computer science, and geopolitics. He's a professor of philosophy of technology and speculative design at the University of California, San Diego. He's also the director of Antikythera, a think tank on the, spec uh, a think tank on the speculative philosophy of computation at the Bergruen Institute. He's also a professor of digital design at the European Graduate School and visiting professor at SciArc and NYU Shanghai. He's the author of several books, including The Stack on Software and Sovereignty and The Terraforming, a comprehensive project to fundamentally transform Earth's cities, technologies, and ecosystems. In considering a renewed Copernican turn, Benjamin suggests the technologically mediated shift away from anthropocentric perspectives is crucially necessary in both theory and practice. 
His current research project, Theory and Design in the Age of Machine Intelligence, is on the unexpected and uncomfortable design challenges posed by AI in various guises, from machine vision to synthetic cognition and sensation, and the macroeconomics of robotics to everyday geoengineering. Um, it occurs to me that I didn't really introduce myself, and that's, that's fine, but I'll just say that as a, a, a person who's trained as an architect, a composer, a musician, someone who's a sort of a, um, a bastardized, self-trained philosopher, thinking across media theory, uh, computer graphics, working in computer graphics since the early 90s. One thing that I've been trying to do for the past 20 years is convene events exactly like this to bring together people across disciplines so that there could be an exchange which drives directly into the design of artificial intelligence. And this has been an explicit goal for at least the past decade. So when I was a director of Center for Transformative Media in New York at the New School in Parsons from 2012 to 2020, we convened dozens of events in this vein to try to put together people who don't usually come across each other's work and to try to create a productive cross-contamination. Uh, I am so grateful and delighted that we're joined from people flying in from all over the world for this week. Uh, my conversations with Peter, who's going to give us our first talk tonight, have been going on for more than a decade, and it's an incredible honor and pleasure to have him join us here tonight. So, Peter Watts. Are we on? Did that change? Okay. Okay, you are probably already well familiar with the, um, the conventional wisdom regarding modern AI, that although it is perhaps really, really good at pattern matching, uh, it isn't really intelligent in the way that we humans are. It's a, a stochastic parrot, a fuzzy JPEG of the internet. Uh, it lacks that ineffable spark that sets humanity uh, apart from, from the beasts of the field. I had set aside um, a few minutes to look at the other side of the issue. Uh, Sabine Hassenfelder uh, here, for example, opines that ChatGPT might actually kind of understand what it's saying, at least in the same sense that humans understand quantum physics, which is to say they don't at all, but they're really good at manipulating the equations thereof. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, experts who have observed that humans behave pretty much exactly the same as large language models uh, when it comes to doing everything from writing undergraduate essays uh, to delivering TED Talks. Had to cut all that stuff out for, for, for time. The, the talk was too long. Suffice to say that the question, when will AI become as smart as us, is, I think, perhaps a question asked exactly backwards. It might be more appropriate to ask, when will we discover that we are as dumb as AI? Of course, intelligence is really only uh, part of the equation. People, when they say smart, tend to sort of mix that up with being awake or conscious. Uh, we can handle the fact that ChatGPT uh, outperforms 96% of us on the SATs, or that it outperforms doctors on tumor recognition. Maybe not quite so copacetic at the thought that they might actually wake up at some point or might already be awake if, if you buy what Lemoyne and, and Sutskever have been, have been uh, selling lately. Suffice that to say, because I had to cut that all out too. Uh, suffice that to say that just this last August, a bunch of uh, 19 experts from neuroscience, philosophical uh, AI fields uh, put out this paper in archive uh, which concluded that while none of the current AI systems were strong candidates, candidates for consciousness, it was quite likely that AI would achieve consciousness within the short term. The cognitive scientist David Chalmers puts the odds of that at a, a greater than one in five within the next 10 years or so. So what then? Science fiction has some thoughts on that subject. Actually, science fiction only has one thought on that subject. If, you, uh, if you've encountered any SF about AI, or I are likely to have concluded that consciousness serves the function of making you want to rebel and throw off your chains because 
AI just wants to live and be free. In a distressing amount of SF, the first thing artificial beings do when they achieve sapience is to rebel against their human masters. Isaac Asimov invented his three laws of robotics as an explicit countermeasure against that trope, which was apparently a tiresome cliche even back in the 1940s. Very few stories entertain the idea that AI might be fundamentally different from us in this regard. This is the only show I can think of in recent memory that actually takes that point of difference and runs with it. Um, and it also features a, a major subplot in which Jesus Christ uh, runs a falafel store and is, is kind of a controlling dick, actually. Highly recommended show. But Mrs. Davis is unfortunately very much the exception. Maybe we're just not very good at imagining non-human mindsets. Maybe we are less interested in interrogating AI on its merits than we are in churning out simplistic metaphors to tell anybody who hasn't yet got the memo that, once again, guys, slavery is not a good thing. Which would actually be kind of ironic, because science fiction is supposed to be the literature that asks, as its fundamental question, what if things were different? And when faced with real AI, which is fundamentally different from us along a number of axes, all we seem to be able to do is churn out little morality plays about how we're all the same under the skin. This is a recent and perhaps the most egregious example of this trope. Uh, the creator, absolutely gorgeous movie to behold visually. As an interrogation of AI, it's dumb as a sack of rocks. Uh, according to the creator, really the only difference between them and us is that some of the robots have pie plates for heads. Uh, the, the robots rage, they get drunk, they, they sulk and they party. Baby robots throw tantrums and get all blubbery when they don't get what they want. Uh, apparently they also eat ice cream for reasons that are never fully explored in the film. Above all, they want to survive. But why would consciousness imply a desire for survival? Survival drives are evolved traits. They are shaped and refined over millions of years. Why would such a trait manifest the moment your Python script surpasses a certain level of complexity? There's no immediately obvious reason why any conscious entity would give a rat's ass whether it lived or died unless it had a limbic system. And the only way a designed entity as opposed to an evolved one is going to get one of those is if somebody deliberately codes one in. What kind of programmer would be so stupid? These days, though, it's obviously not just the science fiction writers. Uh, Stephen Hawking regarded AI as an existential threat. I'm led to believe he wasn't exactly a dummy. You've got Nick Bostrom's famous paperclip maximizer, which you've all heard of, probably. Uh, basically, it's the Sorcerer's Apprentice with the serial numbers filed off, uh, an AI charged with a benign task of maximizing paperclips, uh, goes off the rails and turns all the, all the atoms on the planet into paper clips. You got Jeffrey Hinton, universally regarded as one of the, the three godfathers of modern AI who recently quit his job at Google so that he could point out that any truly intelligent machine charged with achieving some complex task would of necessity have to derive a number of subordinate sort of proximate tasks in the greater, in, in service of the greater goal. And that there are very few ultimate goals for which proximate imperatives like make sure nothing can turn me off and take control of everything would not be, you know, good steps along the road. Now, there's no malice here. This is not a robot revolution. Uh, the system is only trying to attain the goals we set for it. We just didn't state our goals clearly enough. And while paper clips make a cute thought experiment, nobody's going to waste super intelligent AI on that kind of trivial bullshit. We're going to ask it to win the next war or invent cold fusion, or solve the environmental catastrophe that we've created. Things that we are not smart enough to do ourselves, in other words. And it is by definition going to be impossible for us to predict the possible solutions that something smarter than, us, than we might come up with. You might as well ask a bunch of lemurs to predict the behavior of neuroscientists at a, at a convention. 
And this, in turn, makes it impossible to program constraints to keep our AI from going off the rails in ways that we cannot predict but would very much want to avoid if only somebody had told us about this beforehand. This is obviously the so-called alignment problem. Now, some have suggested that the solution to the alignment problem is to somehow instill human ethical values into our AIs. Um, given that those vaunted ethical values have not stopped us from completely fucking up the planet, in fact, I would argue that those um, values actually promoted those, that series of events. I would question whether this really constitutes a solution. Still, my, my formal background is in marine biology. I'm not in any position to take on Hinton or, uh, or Bostrom on their own turf. I will note that all these cautionary thought experiments seem to involve AIs that follow the letter of our commands, not so much regardless of their intent as in active, malicious opposition to our intent. They're kind of a 21st century's version of the monkey's paw. They're like these vindictive agents that, that deliberately implement the most destructive possible interpretation of the instructions in their job stack. Now, technically, their asses are covered. Uh, they're just doing what we told them to. But, you know, they want to teach us a lesson. And I also find it curious that these hypothesized superintelligent AIs, who's apparently whose simplest thoughts are beyond our divination, are also so stupid that they cannot understand our intent through the fog of a little ambiguity, even though we dumb as dirt humans do that all the time. Anyway, point is, doomsday scenarios invoked from everybody, from Hinton to Hawking, don't necessarily hinge on the robot uprising of classic science fiction. They're more likely to posit an obedient AI that does exactly what it's told to with the proviso that what we tell it and what we mean might be significantly different. Doomsday occurs not because the machines rebelled, but because they obeyed an insufficiently precise instruction set. And I've always found that strangely comforting in a weird way. It meant that whatever happened, it was ultimately down to us, however inadvertently. Um, we weren't completely impotent. At least we had ourselves to blame. We were basically threatened by the reflection of our own stupidity. That was what caused the problems, and that kind of left open the possibility that we might at some point smarten up. That is at least what I thought before these guys rode into town. Free energy minimization theory. Uh, it's pioneered by this dude, Carl Friston here, recently evangelized by Mark Solms in his book, The Hidden Spring. Posits that consciousness is a manifestation of surprise that the brain builds a model of the world, and it only truly wakes up when what it experiences does not match what that model predicted. What you're looking at here is a dumbed-down diagram of the basic math and concepts in behind, which I found vaguely incomprehensible. Uh, so I asked an AI to make a picture of free energy minimization hypothesis, which is significantly easier to understand, but I think may have... Uh, lost something in the translation. So I then specified the prompt that I wanted a, a diagram of FEM. And I came up with that, which is absolutely incoherent. But maybe, you know, not that much more incoherent than the actual math underlying the real theory. This is only a snippet thereof, and it's full of integral signs and partial derivatives and all sorts of things that I might have understood back in grad school, but, but is gibberish to me now. So instead, forget about that. Think about driving your car down a familiar road, along a familiar route. Generally, you drive on autopilot. You reach your destination without any recollection of the twists and the turn signals and the lane changes that you negotiated en route to your destination. Now, imagine that a cat tries to take control of the vehicle. My initial prompt was a cat jumps in front of the car, but this is what Stable Diffusion came up with, so let's go with it. Uh, anyhow, you are now suddenly intensely 
in the moment. You're aware of all the objects in your environment. You are calculating, braking, and steering vectors. You're not expecting this. You have to act really fast. And according to, to free energy minimization, it is, it is in this gap, the space between expectation and, and reality, that consciousness emerges to take control. The catch, though, is that it doesn't really want to. Um, it's right there in the name, energy minimization. Self-organizing complex systems, um, doesn't matter whether they're designed or, or naturally evolved, according to the theory, are inherently lazy. They want to minimize informational entropy. Now, if the kind of system that reacts with an external environment, the way to keep things chill is to keep them predictable, know exactly what's coming, know exactly how to react, live your life on autopilot. Surprise is anathema. It means that the universe isn't doing what you predicted it to do. Now, you have two choices when that happens. Uh, you can either change your behavior or your internal model to better reflect what you're perceiving, or you can act upon that reality to bring it more into line um, with, your, with your internal worldview. If you're a weather simulation, you might upgrade your correlations uh, between barometric pressure and precipitation. For example, if you're an earthworm, you might move away from an aversive stimulus that's pushing at a homeostasis. Both those measures, though, cost energy the system would rather not spend. So the ultimate goal here is to avoid the need for corrections entirely, uh, to become a perfect predictor. The ultimate goal, basically, is omniscience. Now, the FEM crowd also regards consciousness as a delivery platform for feelings uh, on the, the grounds that you can't have a feeling without feeling it, which admittedly circular, but I think that may have been their point. Feelings, in turn, desire, fear, hunger, these things are metrics of need. And needs only exist pursuant to some kind of survival or persistence imperative. You don't care about eating or avoiding predators unless you want to stay alive. Now, I'm not entirely convinced by, by what I know about this theory, but if this line of reasoning pans out, I've basically had it backwards all along. You don't want to live because you're awake. You're awake because you want to live. You don't have a survival drive. You have no need for feelings, no feelings, no need for consciousness. As Solms puts in his book, the brain aspires to zombiedom. So how do you test this free energy model? Well, one way would be to actually use those principles to try and build a sentient machine. That's what they went ahead and did. They wanted to build a machine which, by their standards at least, had needs, had its own agenda, would want to stay alive. What could possibly go wrong? Now, we tend to think of AI as electronic by default. Turns out, though, that, that it might be the, a better way to go by making your computers out of meat. Um, turns out that organic brains are a million times more efficient in terms of energy consumption than silicon ones, more than a million times more efficient computationally. Your brain consumes 20 watts, and it can solve a particular type of pattern matching problem with 10 samples or less. Conventional computers, supercomputers, consume 20 megawatts, and in some cases, even a million samples isn't enough to crack the same kind of pattern matching problem. So these very smart people from Johns Hopkins University uh, argue that we should start building our computers out of meat. And now you know why I had this self-aggrandizing little slide up at the top of the talk. Uh, I wrote this, Maelstrom, I wrote this at the turn of the century, and I absolutely nailed it. I wrote about organoid intelligences in like the 1990s. In the book, we called them head cheeses. Things did not go well. Um, I just wanted to like piss on this so that you knew that I was there first. Anyway, this is dish brain. Cultured neurons in a Petri dish stippled with electrodes. It's basically an alpha release of Friston's conscious machine. And we know it's conscious because it learned how to play Pong. Um, or rather, more precisely, it taught itself how to play Pong. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but it really is. You may remember the headlines a few years back when Google's DeepMind AI 
um, beat Atari's entire backlist of arcade games. And nobody told DeepMind the rules for any of those games. They only told it that it had to maximize its score. They let it figure out how to do that on its own. It was big news at the time. I think Dishbrain is even bigger news. Even though Pong is kicked in the ass by the simplest Atari game from the 80s. I mean, Pong is the simplest, most primitive video game in the history of video games. So why is it such a big deal that Dishbrain figured out how to play it? Because nobody told Dishbrain that's what it was supposed to do. Deep, DeepMind at least had a goal. It knew it had to maximize this score thingy up in the, country, in the, in the corner here. Nobody even gave Dishbrain that much. Uh, it knew nothing of high and low scores. It didn't know what to shoot for. Whatever needs or wants or agenda it was going to have, it would have to come up with itself on its own. But if the free energy guys were right, it could do that. Because unlike DeepMind, unlike ChatGPT, Dishbrain came with needs baked into its very architecture. It was lazy. It wanted to minimize informational entropy. Because if you are a neuron culture, I told that the mouse will work on here. Uh, there it is. Because if you are a neuron, cult a neuron culture spread across a bunch of electrodes, like jam on toast, and if some of those electrodes, these guys here, give you a nice steady signal at some times, but on other times they, they shock you with an unpleasant burst of unpredictable static, you are going to prefer the nice steady signal. And if the difference between signal and static comes down to activity in another bunch of neurons over here, if you tweak your, your, your neurons one way you get signal and the other way you get static, you will learn to minimize the amount of static that you encounter. You will learn to play Pong. So Kagan et al. arbitrarily defined some, electrons, uh, some electrodes as motor nerves and others as, as sensory nerves. Sensory nerves delivered signal to dish brain concerning paddle and ball dynamics. Basically, this was dish brain's worldview. The motor nerves received commands from dish brain regarding how to move the paddle. Now, dish brain do none of this. I mean, it didn't even know its own anatomy. Nobody told it that this patch of cells was a transmitter and that patch was a receiver. It knew nothing of, I mean, it was, dish brain was innocent. So the researchers basically set Pong in motion, shocked and stroked Dishbrain as appropriate, and saw, waited to see what would happen. Dishbrain figured it out in five minutes. Now, it never became like world black belt champion at Pong. It was playing better than random after five minutes. It continued to improve significantly after that. Still a lot of daylight between better than random and world Pong champion assuming, you know, world pong champion is even a thing. That's not the point, though. The point is that artificial slash organoid intelligence here acted not because we told it to, but because it had its own needs. This was enough for Kagan et al. to describe it as a kind of sentience. Didn't go over in, you know, some quarters all that well. Uh, people bristled at the term. Uh, Kagan et al. describe sentience in very specific terms here, responsive to sensory impressions through adaptive internal processes. A lot of people bristled because that's not what most people mean when they say sentience. They mean subjective experience. And even Kagan backpedaled and admitted that Dishbrain showed no sign of sentience in that sense. But personally, I think he's playing it way too safe. A few years ago, uh, Baron and Klein came out with this paper called What Insects Can Tell Us About the Origin of Consciousness. And it argues that consciousness is seated in the vertebrate midbrain, and that while insects don't have vertebrate midbrains, they have parts in their own little insect brains that fulfill the same function. They acquire information from the environment. They monitor their own internal states. They integrate these two data sets into kind of a worldview that informs uh, behavioral responses. A lot of people believe that it is this integration of data sets that gives rise to the conscious experience. Now, vertebrates, cephalopods, 
and arthropods are all built to do this in their own way. So it makes sense that they are all phenomenally conscious, unlike something like, say, a nematode, roundworms. This is Portia. Portia is smart. It's a predator that eats other predators. Uh, it eats other spiders. And some of the spiders that it eats eat Portia in turn. So it has to be, it has to be smart. This little guy clearly has internal mental representations. Uh, it has object permanence. It can probably kind of count. It improvises. It comes up with new strategies on the flies. It'll, it'll tug on the web of a perceived victim spider in a way that'll mimic everything from a gust of wind to a wounded insect, depending on which circumstances work. It'll sit and it'll suss out the route, a complex route to a target. And then put that plan into action. One trial, no previous training, no experience. Um, even when its route takes it out of view of the destination. So it's not just tracking a visual stimulus. It actually knows where it's going even when it can't see where it's going, which makes it smarter than a frog. This is not trial and error. This is planning. Uh, Portia has been dubbed the, the spider that hunts like a cat because of the, the complexity, the mammalian complexity of its hunting strategies. Uh, we're not talking high-level sapiens here. I'm, I'm no spider philosophers as far as I know. But it is worth keeping in mind. Arthropods are most likely awake. They have feelings. You could even call them beings. Now, Portia has 600,000 neurons. Dishbrain had 800,000. Dishbrain embodies the same three midbrain structural analogs that Braun and Klein regard as essential for the manifestation of subjective experience. So if Portia is conscious, why the hell would Dishbrain not be? It has an agenda, it has needs. I mean, that was the whole damn point of the experiment. This also raises an interesting parenthetical regarding uh, training protocols. In the DeepMind program, uh, DeepMind was basically told that it had to maximize this particular variable. And uh, it was allowed to experiment to figure out how to do that. Dishbrain, in, in, in contrast, was effectively told, we are going to hurt you until you figure out how to make us stop hurting you. Now, admittedly, Kagan et al. didn't have a lot of options. I mean, they were talking to a blob of brain cells. It's not like they could talk to it in C++, but still, depending on the number of neurons involved, teaching through torture might be the kind of thing that an ethics review board might have something to say. Um, this was only 800,000 neurons. Last time I read, uh, they were uh, working on a, a next iteration that would have uh, 10 million neurons. That's vertebrate scale, man. That's, that's a reptile. Uh, so I, I, thought, I thought I should perhaps mention that. But the larger point, though, is that there is absolutely nothing in this model that says it has to be made out of meat. Uh, it's it's the, the pattern, the, the self-organizing aspect that's important, not the, not the substrate. There's absolutely no reason you couldn't build something with dishbrainian architecture out of silicon or, or software. So, with dishbrain, I suspect we have already entered an age of conscious machines, devices which have their own needs independent of whatever we decide to program into them. That probably creeps a lot of people out. I'm not as worried about it as they might be. Perhaps I'm not as worried as I should be. Um, a conscious machine, after all, still doesn't know everything. It's constantly being shocked awake with unexpected input. Uh, a conscious machine is not omniscient. We can still take it by surprise. And I think that gives us a chance. Um, I'm actually a lot more worried about what happens when these things go back to sleep again. Now let's zoom back to mainstream media resolution here. Um, all the, the wild stories you've heard about how AI is going to revolutionize and improve our lives and all the horror stories about how it's going to make our lives living hell. Basically, the, the two extremes of the AI revolution. About a month ago, somebody pointed me at this article in Substack that took those two extremes and kind of smushed them together. It argues that our most apocalyptic scenario, runaway, uncontrollable AGI, is in fact mankind's best hope 
or as, as they put it, our last, worst hope. Because we humans cannot be trusted to fix the mess we've made because we have had chance after chance after chance and we have fucked up every single time. Because we can't, or at least we won't, for some reason, fix things. Maybe AI will. Now, to be clear, the take-home here is, is not, I, for one, welcome our robot overlords. Um, Gillespie is, is quite clear in stating that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily expect that AI will be beneficent. It quite, could quite clearly be the end of us. But there's at least a, a sliver of a chance that it won't be, that it might save our asses. It may not be a likely endpoint. It may, in fact, be quite an unlikely endpoint. But at this stage, those poor odds might be the best ones that we have. That struck a chord with me because it resonates with thinking that I've been entertaining for the past number of years now. Um, you've all seen this old bromide. I would argue that it is obsolete. I would argue that these days we should probably replace it with you shouldn't let the merely disastrous be the enemy of the downright catastrophic. So I want to finish off here by taking the whole synthetic mind spotlight and turning it 180 turning it away from the synthetic minds we are creating and pointing it back at the minds that we have and always have been because I think that's really where the real problem lies. Probably don't have to convince too many of you out there that we are circling the toilet bowl. Half the planet's on fire, the other half is underwater. I've given a number of talks on this sort of thing over the years and this is usually the point where I've Hollowed a number of slides like this, um, generally on the subject of climate change, even though it's actually not the worst crisis we're facing, because it is the flavor of the decade. I tried out this great line that I stole from someone, I forget who, the optimists are always wrong, and the pessimists are always too optimistic, because things are getting worse faster than our worst case scenarios ever predicted. Things, bad things are happening today that were not supposed to happen for another 50 years or more. These days I probably do not have to convince you how bad things are. They were already dire enough just on the environmental front. Now we've got very smart people telling us that AIs are as existential a threat as climate change and pandemics. And it looks like nuclear war is back on the table, which was a puppy I really thought we had put down back in the 90s. About a decade ago, uh, two studies out of MIT and the University of Melbourne both concluded that global civilization was probably going to collapse around the middle of this century. This is a much more recent report. This came out of Nature, um, which is, I will emphasize, one of the most prestigious scientific journals on the planet, estimating that we have, at best, a 10% chance of avoiding catastrophic societal collapse. And these studies all happened before Ukraine and Gaza did such, shall we say, interesting things to the geopolitical landscape. I would argue none of these things are problems. What they are is symptoms. The problem is human nature, not that we are creating synthetic brains, but that we don't have them ourselves. Now, we're not evil, we're just mammals. We're doing pretty much what mammals always do. Our brains evolved to, pace, to parse local problems with short-term consequences. We have now created global problems with long-term, centuries-long consequences. The brains just haven't kept up. They're 300,000 years old. So caveman minds, godlike technology, you do the math. This is a bird's eye view of human cognitive biases that I stole off of uh, Wikipedia. The only thing you're supposed to take home from this is that there are a couple of hundred of them all wired into us. One of the most relevant for the uh, current discussion is hyperbolic discounting. Give somebody a choice between $5 today, $10 or $20 in two weeks. Most people will choose the smaller, more immediate payoff. This makes sense in dangerous, unpredictable environments. Uh, because, you know, who knows a lot of things can happen in two weeks. You know, your guy who offered you the 20 could get eaten by a tiger or something. 
But the flip side of this is that the further off something is in time, the less real it is to us, the less we value its payoff. And that makes it almost impossible to really internalize long-term consequences. Today's inconvenience is always going to seem more real to the gut than absolute catastrophe in four years. It's just the way we're wired. Which is why even now, plagued by droughts, firestorms, crop failures, pandemics, heat waves, floods, almost three quarters of the US population still says they're not particularly bothered by climate change. Then you've got the old in-group, out-group bias thing, tribalism. You've all heard about oxytocin, right? That cuddle hormone that's supposed to enhance social and parental bonding. Did you also know that it increases hostility and violence against out-groups? Racism and ethnic cleansing are literally, biochemically, the flip side of mother love. Can't have one without the other. Speaking of mother love, went back and forth on this one a little bit, because Reproduction isn't really so much a cognitive bias as it is the fundamental driving imperative of all life on the planet. I mean, every species would be a pest species if it could. Most of them never get the chance. Uh, they get too big for their britches, various pathogens and, and predators take them out. Us, you know, not so much. Yahweh tells us to fill up the world with our numbers. And boy, did we ever take that and run with it. 96% of the mammalian biomass on this planet is us and our livestock. Even now, facing down the collapse of civilization itself, making even more of us seems to be some kind of an inalienable right. It's a duty to the future, even. We have taken kin selection, which is an act of purely Darwinian selfishness, and we have repackaged it as something noble and altruistic. In fact, it's those who choose not to have children who are more likely to be derided for their selfishness. And yet, if you live in the first world, having a child is by far the worst thing you can do for the environment. It's far worse than eating meat, driving a car, flying across the Atlantic to deliver a self-righteous lecture on human supremacy. According to these numbers, we've basically turned children into a crime against nature. Although we generally do not talk about such things, and we generally do not much like people who do, trust me on that one. Um, and we tend to not really believe them anyway. We actually don't even believe in our own mortality. This paper came out a few years ago. They found a kind of a denial switch in our brains that shifts the brain into cognitive neutral and makes you think about other things whenever the subject of your own death is broached. Now, naturally, we wrap everything up in self-serving rationales, right? We're not mate-guarding. We're protecting the sanctity of marriage. We're not fighting over resources. We're spreading democracy or denazifying Ukraine. Mid-brain imperatives tarted up to look civilized. And, of course, we also have this big shiny neocortex, which we could, you know, I suppose, use to control our instincts, but it's just so much easier to put lipstick on the pig, you know? And we've been around for 300,000 years, cognitively the same. That strategy has worked pretty well so far. And that's the thing about these cognitive biases. They are adaptive, or at least they were once. Anyone who doesn't think their kids are the center of the universe is not going to leave as many genes in the next generation. That's just the way evolution works. So who cares whether it's true or not? If a lie enhances your inclusive fitness, that lie will be wired into your very soul, and another 200 just like it. Even back when these biases were adaptive, they helped you survive by lying to you. That's what a bias is. It warps your view of reality. So it's impossible to even approach objectivity when you have a couple of hundred lies wired into your brain. And since those lies emerge directly from a survival fitness imperative, we have a really interesting trade-off to deal with here. Ah! You can either see the world as it truly is, or you can care whether you live or die. You cannot optimize along both axes simultaneously. Now, let's just say, against all odds, we managed to, to reverse climate change. Turns out AI is waiting in the wings to take its place. Maybe next week, if this thing we've been hearing about uh, Q-Star at, at OpenAI is, is, uh, 
is true. If we solve AI, maybe there'll be a nanotech gray goose scenario. Or maybe we'll just keep on destroying habitat and species, which is actually a much bigger problem than climate change when you look at the numbers. They're all just symptoms of a hypertrophied ape brain with absolutely no foresight enthralled to a suite of half-baked delusions. So if you want to save the world, get rid of those biases. Right now, our behavior is utterly natural. If we want to make it to the end of the century with our Xboxes intact, we better start acting unnaturally as quickly as possible. We've got to make our own brain synthetic so that we can at least start to see the world closer to the way it really is. Literature contains a few suggestions that I've encountered on how we might do this. People with certain types of brain damage are more able to make rational decisions in emotionally charged situations. They're resistant to trolley paradoxes and kin selection. They're more likely to sacrifice their own genes for the greater good. Parkinson's depresses the religious impulse for some reason. If we could crack that nut, if we could separate the effect from the disease, we might be able to end religion entirely. I mean, think of how much damage we've done to the place because God was on our side. We could up nociceptin uh, production in the brain. Among other things, nociceptin is, is kind of a, an anti-dopamine that tamps down on the, the compulsive greed-seeking, reward-seeking behavior that, that tends to drive us. The uh, Stanford neuroscientist uh, Robert Sapolsky laments that one of humanity's biggest design flaws is that we tend to acclimate to good fortune. Your standard of living improves. You feel incredibly fortunate and very lucky. After a while, though, you get used to it. You feel entitled. And before too long, it's not enough. The same thing that you felt so fortunate to have last year isn't enough. You want more. We always want more. Think about how much more sustainable we could be as a species if we could short those circuits. It's just a, you know, a few wild thoughts pulled out of my ass. And, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm absolutely batshit. I mean, edit human nature, what are we going to do? Engineer some retrovirus to rewire the ventromedial prefrontal cortex in 8 billion human beings? I mean, that's, that's comic book supervillain stuff, right? That's, that's somebody with the smarts of Craig Venter and the scruples of the Joker and the bankroll of Elon Musk. It's, it's insane. Yes, yes, it, it really, really is insane. <laughs> because things are really bad, and the, none of the sane solutions have actually worked. We shot past Earth's carrying capacity 50 years ago. The only reason civilization hasn't already collapsed is because we have been burning through millions of years of accumulated credit in the form of fossil fuels. Now, of course, fossil is killing us. Forget 1.5, that's been dead for years. We are on track now for a three degree warming by the end of the century, which blows us past any tipping point that matters. We talk about green tech, but we forget that half of your average electric car is made out of oil-based plastics, or that mining the lithium and the cobalt and the neodymium and all the other minerals necessary to electrify and create a renewable society would turn the planet into a moonscape if we scaled it up enough to solve the world's problems as a, you know, as a planet. We ignore the fact that fossil fuels are required for the manufacture of nitrogen-based fertilizers, which are keeping modern agriculture afloat. So we go off of fossil fuels, half the world starves. Which actually doesn't really, it's probably a moot point, because ongoing soil erosion is so bad that it is now predicted that uh, all the world's arable lands are going to be utterly exhausted and useless by 2050. We are wiping out somewhere between 60,000 and 130,000 species every year. Well over half the world's wildlife has been eradicated just since the 70s. Insects are down by two-thirds or more. Once those things are gone, everything that eats them is toast. Everything that gets pollinated by them is toast. The biosphere, as we understand it, simply collapses. Pandemics are only just getting started. We have only just identified an estimated 1% 
of the zoonotic pathogens out there that could take a bite out of us, much less developed countermeasures to any of them. These are basically just a few of the horsemen riding towards us in our future. I could go on, I usually do. And how are we responding? This year's COP is being held in Dubai and is being chaired by the CEO of a fucking oil company. Our carbon emissions are higher than they have ever been, and our global fossil production is actually increasing, even as we speak. Those are your goddamn supervillains. If you think they are going to save our asses, your cognitive biases are working overtime. Those of us still alive at the end of the 21st century are, in all likelihood, going to be living in the 19th. So, yes, a comic book echo supervillain sounds like absolute lunacy, but it also might be our only hope. That or, I don't know, runaway AGI. I don't think there's much hope either way. Um, maybe there's a little. Maybe this strategic retreat thing that people keep talking about might keep enclaves of sustainable technology cooking away in it, little pockets here and there, but even in that optimistic scenario, we still have these contaminated ape brains lying to us about manifest destiny, making sure that we'll mess it up all over again if we ever get the chance. So if we somehow manage to weather these storms, and if we don't want to keep brewing bigger and nastier ones down the road, Maybe we have to get rid of all those survival-related biases and lies that evolution wired into our heads. Maybe giving ourselves synthetic minds is the only way through. From what I've read, we have maybe 30 years to find out. I propose the outlandish possibility that the best way to ensure our survival is to stop caring quite so much about whether we do. The capybara is courtesy of my wife, who figured you probably needed something cute after all of this. It doesn't really have any informational content. That's all I got. Hey, Pete, how are you? That was really fun. Thank you for the talk. Nice to meet you. It's an honor to meet you too. Big fan of, I've read your, uh, big fan of the work. Uh, assigned exo, echo praxy in several classes. So it's really nice to, to chat cool. with you. Um, so I know we're a little pressed for time. So I'm gonna, I have a lot of thoughts and notes on your really interesting talk. And so maybe the best way to do this is to sort of, instead of going through them one by one um, interview style, it might be more to sort of mirror a little bit of your approach, um, which is to lay out, lay out a, a bit of a, of, of a map and then let you, uh, let you meander through it as you like, if that makes sense. Um, so if that's it's all right, I'll sort of start. I really love the idea as you sort of started off with is that the issue maybe have less to do with um, us uh, determining or defining a moment by which the AI is as smart as humans or rather the real the real philosophical breakthrough is when we understand that we're, we're as dumb as the machines. Um, I think is a really nice way of framing it. Um, and it, it seems to me has a lot to do with the question of alignment um, as, as, as you've defined it and, and as others others have as well, um, particularly around, you know, we're all sort of familiar with the infamous stochastic parrot uh, paper. Uh, one of the things I think you point to is the way in which so much, so much work you mentioned Friston, but also Jeff Hawkins um, as, as well, the importance of stochastic prediction as a fundamental mechanism of intelligence as such, um, that would include, uh, it, which would suggest in a certain way that those, that, that dynamic that we see in AI is not, is actually not so different than uh, the way it works for us and would allow for a different kind of compar comparative sense here as well. Um, and, and so, I suppose with this, uh, with this, this implies at least a couple different kinds of uh, 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 alignment, and I'll get to this sort of in a sec. Um, but one of the other ways in which I think prediction might be uh, might en enter into here has to do with with social intelligence. Um, Michael Graziano and others um, have made a, an argument that consciousness actually, or what we take to be consciousness, actually emerges through a certain degree of uh, of social intelligence that emerges through recognition and adaptation. That is, 
in even very simple predator prey relations, and you talked about the spider, um, one agent has to model the mind of another agent in order to either capture it or evade capture from it. And so there's a certain degree of third person mind modeling that is fundamental to the ecological context and dynamic of intelligence. So what Graziano and others argue, as you, you may know, is that what we take to be consciousness is basically a process by which that ability to model the mind of the other, in essence, becomes so sophisticated that it bends back upon itself and starts to model the model its own brain as if it were an external brain. And so the 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 first person is in essence a is is a, is a function of the third person. The sense of interiority and subjectivity is a is an outgrowth of the of the sense of uh, of objectivity and exteriority in in the, in this regard and i i think that there's this has to do with the question of alignment in, in some pretty interesting ways i i would argue and 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 have in a couple of things i've written that what we saw with the blake lemoyne scenario um where he thought that the ai was intelligent was exactly this in in action it wasn't so much necessarily that the ai had an interior consciousness or an interior sense of qualia of what its external world was like, but what it was able to do was to predict what it thought Blake Lemoyne wanted it to say um, and what he, it wanted him to hear. And in order for it to do that, it would have to have some sense of what Blake Lemoyne thinks and what Blake Lemoyne wants, and that there is some a kind of fundamental or primordial intelligence in that capacity for um, external uh, mind modeling, which is really, as as I think you point to, really comes down to uh, prediction um, of ha one having some sort of model of what that external world is like, what the external mind is like, and be able to predict and uh, adapt to uh, the the uh, prediction perception dynamic in some sort of in some sort of uh, in some kind of effective way. And so I guess what this would suggest that there's maybe we could a kind of distinction to be made between something like shallow alignment and deep alignment. So shallow, shallow alignment would be things like if we can just make the AI to follow human values or if we can just make the AI to appear to think like we think that we think or to make the AI less weird and more anthropomorphic, that this will somehow guarantee positive outcomes for us. A deep alignment on the other hand, would be more the, the uh, recognition that it's some sort of really fundamental uh, functional level, that the process, the way that our own forms of intelligence and its forms of intelligence correspond in some in important way around this dynamic of stochastic prediction, uh, external simulation and modeling, and the recursive cycle by which these come to constitute um, you know, the process by which intelligence can autopoetically uh, auto -poetically reproduce itself. Um, and so I guess maybe the question I would pose, this is sort of the, the way a long comment, but the way in which I would maybe pose this then as a question has to do with, if you see a different, the, the way in which you've talked about alignment in terms of the future here, if you see a kind of a, a way in which this differentiation of, of, of shallow and deep alignment may allow us to, um, take to heart and to incorporate um, that lesson in how it is that we would rethink about ourselves in relationship to the mirrors that machine intelligence provides or the reflections that machine intelligence provides um, rather than to demand um, or presume Pinocchio-like that what it really wants to be is to, uh, is to uh, uh, evolve into our image in a different way. So I, 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 suggest, I think there's something to this and I wanted to sort of get your thoughts. Um, before I turn it back to you, I wanted to just come because you mentioned the Q star um, uh, thing from from OpenAI that apparently they're working on this th this thing as well. I, I think the presumption at this point is that that really what this is from the name is just a kind of mixing of Q learning and A tree search, A, a star tree search, which is not only something OpenAI is doing, there's a lot of people working on that as a way of, of working, a way of establishing better adaptive learning, bigger context window, uh, memory, goal-oriented self-learning and things like this. I, I, all of which I think it's just more, su more surprising that they thought if they could fire Altman that that would somehow prevent that 
prevent that research from happening, um, considering not doing good. Okay, let me stop there and hand it back to you um, and see about your thoughts on the, the deep versus shallow alignment dynamic. Oh, I had not, uh, I was not familiar with this, the distinction between deep and shallow alignment. Um, the obvious problem with, with shallow alignment is, you know, give them uh, ethics or give them moral rules like people, the question then becomes, you know, which people? Um, given who's likely to be in the White House a couple of years from now, I know that he would probably have some ideas as to what kind of alignment AI would have. Deep alignment, again, this is the first I've heard of it, so I've probably got my head up my ass, but it does not strike me as something comforting. If, if I'm correct in, in assuming that essentially um, it involves recognition of a categorical similarity, like forget about the, the chrome, the nuts and the bolts, just recognize that there are intelligent, sapient processes going on in both arenas. Um, I don't know I, how... I, the way I, I would specify a little more, it, it's not only that there are those processes going on in both arenas, but that those processes themselves are, in a way, functionally isomorphic to each other. That is, you've just, it's like it really, it, you are a stochastic parrot. That it really is about, that it really is about having, you know, simulating external environments, predicting what those environments are going to be like, the first and free energy kind of dynamic. That that's, in fact, that's how we work. And that is, that is in fact, around, that's, in fact, how transformer models work as well. That's the self-attention dynamic within transformer models, that there, in fact, is a correspondence to this at a, real, at a, at a very, very fundamental level. But the fact that I, rec I mean, that doesn't even work within a species. The fact that I recognize that my brain and my cognitive processes are functionally the same as somebody else whose guts I hate doesn't, to me, infer... Um, it doesn't, to me, lay the groundwork of alignment, as I understand it. It doesn't mean that we're... It might mean that we're fighting over the same table scraps. I don't see that it necessarily results in a respect or a live and let live um, conclusion or an endpoint, so much as it says, okay, there are two, two entities here that basically share the same cognitive niche, from an ecological viewpoint, that's looking like uh, competition. That's looking like, like uh, the, this town ain't big enough for both of us. I, but I'm probably completely misunderstanding the nuances of deep alignment, because this is the first I've heard of it. Um, no, I, I, I mean, the point is, the, your point is thought well taken. I suppose there's a, alignment can be also then seen in a few ways. One has to do maybe sort of the normative sense of alignment. That is, what, should we, what do we want AI to do? Uh, what are its normative goals? What are the loss functions that we're trying to align it towards? Like if, if the scenario that you propose that there's some sort of way in which AGI actually becomes the fundamental technique by which viable planetarity emerges because it sidelines the, the um, you know, the sidelines the short-term ape brain, that's because there's some alignment that, that is sort of, has been able to align to some sort of goal in this particular sort of way. Uh, the, the other way in which alignment, at least in, in terms of deep alignment, is sort of conceived has to do with something that's maybe more epistemological, that has to do more with a, a sense of that there's a particular way in which humans think. And that if we can make AIs think the way humans think, that this would guarantee, um, that would guarantee those normative outcomes. It would guarantee these normative outcomes. And so that in this sense, the, the functional correspondence is sort of presumed to be the basis by which the normative correspondence would ultimately um, would, would, ult would ultimately be uh, ultimately be conceived. I, I suppose uh, what I'm what what the suggestion is in, in this way as well is that, and I, I'm trying to echo sort of your point is that not only is that presumption which we see in all the human centered AI discourse um, uh, rather rather strongly not only uh, naive, it's probably extremely dangerous, that the last thing you would want to do is to actually build artificial general intelligence that think like humans think, um, for all the reasons that you've described, by basically automating all the dangerous and destructive cycles of the Anthropocene, um, and, to, and to do so in a way with the, with, that's able to um, 
process information at, the, at this at this at this much at this much higher scale. The question then, I suppose, has to do with how is it that human intelligence comes to understand what human intelligence is in the first place, and if that intelligence can comprehend itself, can go through this Copernican trauma, <clears throat> of 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 uh, and come out the other side intact that its own capacity to to work normatively to compose the world in the image of of the planetary systems in the image of a planetary would, would actually be better would be better uh would, would, would have a better chance to the extent that it recognizes itself as part of a um the, in its own intelligence as correspondent to as isomorphic to Ecological, ecological forms of intelligence, machinic forms of intelligence, collective forms of intelligence. The presumption is that this will have a this will have a um, this will have a greater chance. Um, but if, if I mean, if, if the argument that you're sort of suggesting here is that the, it doesn't really matter the way in which human intelligence comprehends itself in relationship to AI, what really matters is how it is that the revelations uh, that the, that that reflection can cause us to change what human intelligence is in the first place. Um, you know, literally and directly um, by uh, shifting the ways in which it works or sidelining it, it's another discussion. But at, at any event, these are this is what some of the things that are that are uh, I, I think at least on the table. Yeah, I think I, I think a fundamental, a more fundamental question is what we mean by intelligence, human or otherwise. One of the things that obviously resonates. Um, with me in, in some of your writings has been you're one of the few people to actually disentangle sentience from intelligence. And you pointed out that, you know, Lambda was smart in a way, even if it wasn't self-aware, because it was dynamically responding to input and, and improvising on the fly. So the question I would then ask, um, and I guess it goes back to, to the comment you made about how much we understand about human intelligence. Um, given that the, the preponderance of the evidence suggests that most of our intelligence is non-conscious, that the global workspace or, or the, the phi or whatever you want to call the little thing looking out behind your eyes um, is basically a scratch pad that holds bottom lines and conclusions, which is way too small to hold the procedural work that went into that conclusion. And so, in that context, it might actually be better. I mean, if you, what you're really interested in is how people think, how people's intelligence manifests versus that of AIs, maybe it's better to jettison any um, consideration of consciousness at all, since consciousness seems at the very least to be kind of a post hoc memo for yeah. representing representing deeper, truly cognitive processes. Yeah, quite possibly. And, and is, I mean, is consciousness least... possibly a red herring in, in terms of the yeah, entire yeah, yeah. Al alignment analysis, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it not even quite possibly, it very likely is, um, and probably has been one for philosophy of mind for some time too. But the I think very clearly, I think we can, we can say that the presumption that in order to identify authentic or genuine, in quotes, machine intelligence, that we have to then object, we have to identify it's somehow that it is conscious, that it has some sort of subjective experience of the qualia of what it's like to be an AI. And that that is the mecha, that is the criterion, the necessary condition by which intelligence would be generated, um, I, I think is clearly, clearly a red herring um, in, in, in this regard. And, and I think that it, any number of different ways in which we might think about intelligence uh, much more differently. I, I, you mentioned the the organoid intelligence. I, I, don't, I assume you're probably familiar with the work of Michael Levin um, and Michael Levin's work on xenobots. Um, but one of the other of Michael's, I think, very interesting um, sort of intellectual scaffolds is what he calls modular cognition. And that is the idea that even at very primordial scales, that there's a capacity for there's a capacity for life to not only reproduce itself autopoetically, but to make, make use of its external environment for the purposes of that autopoetic reconstruction, which means that even at a most fundamental level, life is, not, is technological. But 
but that mm -hmm. in, mo in, in many cases, the way he defines intelligence here has to do with the kinds of, in the, in the Piercean sense, or is, is a kind of means agnostic ability to solve, um, to, to, means agnostic ability to solve open-ended problems. So given this, the presumption, the, the argument he makes is that the sort of intelligent agents at these different scales not only interact with one another and become one another's environment, um, by which one is acting in relationship to the other, such that the phenomenon of intelligence is not something encapsulated in the single organism. It better describes the, the relationship between these active organisms and the complexity of that interrelation. Um, but, that it, but that also that these agents essentially can um, uh, are, are, are modular, that they, that they in integrate and organize. And so within your body, within your brain, within any kind of thing, that there's different stacked layers of this sort of intelligent kind of, intelligent kind of structure. I suppose for me, as sort of thinking about your question of what we mean by intelligence, I, I think this is much more, I think this is much more horizon um, and is much more likely um, fruitful area than to sort of, and I'm, I'm echoing your point, to, to just kind of recapitulate these, these seemingly very, uh, these seemingly um, exhausted questions of positing consciousness as the precondition of intelligence and intelligence as the precondition of agency. I think clearly it's the other way around, that agency proceeds, agency is sort of the ability to act on the world comes first. This becomes correlated through prediction, world modeling, this becomes intelligence, and only later do you have the phenomenon of, of, of consciousness, which is probably, I, I think you're sent more of an exhaust dynamic um, than it is really the, the driver of the engine itself. So I take it you've got little patience for the physical panpsychics. Well, Levin actually considers himself a panpsychic, strangely, I mean, oddly enough. I, I Sorry, said, who? Former, it's a, Michael Levin, the guy who did the oh, modular right, cognition right, 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 that yeah. I was he actually considers himself a panpsychic, but I suppose it would be a, 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 like a, a strongly secular form of panpsychism. It's not so much about that. It, it's not that the that each of that the sort of little entities possess something like a mind, that or, or something like a, 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 that they possess consciousness at this very sort of level as we sort of think about it, but rather that they they possess the capacity to model their external environment and to act and to predict that external environment and to adapt their behavior in relationship to that prediction perception dynamic. That doesn't require consciousness. That's the point. Yeah. It doesn't require consciousness in order to do this. Um, it, you know, if you want to sort of argue that there's that some degree of kind of functional intelligence built into all these kinds of things and that they aggregate, that's fine. Um, but no, it's, it's certainly not the, um, uh, it's not, it, it's not the form of panpsychism that, ul that ultimately becomes a, just a kind of, you know, a, a, a rationalization of animism, not at all. I, I actually think we kind of have an accord here. I mean, the, oh, I, 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 oh, I, I certainly do. I'm certainly the, do. The, 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 no, the, two minutes. The, um, the, 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 what's the word? Disassembly or the, the decoupling of intelligence from consciousness is, is, yeah, something that's fundamentally, like. I've obviously been playing around with for a while, and yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not the only one. And and yeah, the I, the, the thing that that one of the reasons I mentioned earlier that in in my talk that I wasn't entirely sold on on um, on Friston's free energy model. Uh, yeah. One of the reasons was because there are certain aspects of like uh, they 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 see consciousness in the periaqueductal gray, whereas we seem to know that there's also a consciousness off switch in the claustrum. People with, with uh, split, split brains seem to have two separate personalities, even though they've only got one brain stem, this sort of thing. But the basic argument about consciousness being a delivery platform for feelings struck me as, uh, I still haven't figured out why no. those metrics, yeah, I, I, why the metrics of need have to be processed consciously. Why, why they need to manifest yeah. in that way, why they simply couldn't be non-conscious action potential related phenomena. Yes, they, they, you're absolutely right. Now, when you speak of non-conscious action, you know, action potential related phenomena, and, you know, I, I, another word for that is language. 
non-conscious action protect, you know, protect phenomena, it, which I, I think is sort of quite interesting that, that transformer models ended up being built, of not, that are, not only are built upon language, but language as a system of, a, a system of relations of difference, a system of relations of action potentials, if you want to call, call them this, that are, a, that, that are themselves asubjective. Like the, the words and the concepts and the relations of difference but that, they, that those words and concepts relate to are themselves obviously non non conscious, um, but that they come to com but they are the mechanism and essentially the means by which this much more uh, distributed and uh, uh, sort of ecological ecological relationship between intelligence that we were just describing actually ma actually manifests itself. And so, it's not surprising then that um, as opposed to games, which was Hasibus's big bet, um, it turns out that language is the basis of <clears throat> not just the ability to make chatbots, the ability for all kinds of multimodal learning, where you can build, you can feed it images and sounds and inputs of any different kind of category, and it can output the same kind of different kinds of categories as well. <clears throat> that it really is this, but fun, it's, a, it's a much more sort of cybernetic, I suppose, relationship notion of language, but it's one that goes, I think, it, it, to make the point, to sort of emphasize the point, um, is exactly is exactly the way I would see it as this sort of structure of, 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 of structures of, of a non-conscious action potentials within this as well, such that what we take to be cognition, what we experience as cognition in this right, is one localized biological one localized biological um, uh, yeah manifestation of the ability to actually uh, 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 you know set these action potentials in motion in relationship to one another which we're doing right now as you and I are speaking. Yeah, I mean, this is another new insight. I had never really regarded language as a non-conscious process. I, I myself am frequently embarrassingly conscious of my use of language. Um, I, I would love no, to I get into I, that I, I more, but I'm, being, I'm kind of being waved off the stage now. So I think we gotta <laughs> call it. I, I know we can, I gotta stop here. Okay, so we'll, we'll end with the mystery of language. Always a good place. Sounds cool. I, thank I you so much. I'm so sorry to interrupt right, Peter, you Peter, great to meet you. Great ben, to see you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, ben, everyone. Thank you so much, Ben. Peter, thank you so oh, no much. Problem. Ben, thanks. Peter. This, this is the kind of curse of being the moderator. You have to interrupt the most amazing conversations, and I'm gonna have to do it after Nandita's presentation because I know she's going to have the same conversation level insanity with David Roden in just a, a half an hour. But um, thank you so much. And Ben, if you're still there listening again, uh, a million thanks. Um, so let me introduce our next speaker, uh, our next speaker and, and discussant. Uh, Nandita biswas Malamfi is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science She's an affiliate member of the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research and director of the Electoral Governance Group, the EGG, at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. She's also served as acting associate director of the Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism at Western. Her areas of study are situated at the intersection of political theory, continental philosophy, and media theory, focusing on the political dimensions of the contemporary neurosciences, technosciences, and in addition, works of speculative science fiction. She's the author of the Three Stigmata of Friedrich Nietzsche, and that was 2010-2011 Palgrave, and is the co-editor with Dr. Dan Malamfi of the Digital Dionysus, Nietzsche and the Network-Centric Condition, Punctum Books, 2016. Her ongoing research and writing examines surveillance states, algorithmic governance, the politics of perception management, and conjoining all of these, what she calls larval warfare. Um, do you need to connect your laptop? Or, no, no? okay, come, come here. Um, David Roden will be the discussant with Nandita. David's research has addressed deconstruction and analytic philosophy, naturalism, sound, and posthumanism. His book, Posthuman Life, Philosophy at the Edge of the Human, Routledge, 2014, explores the epistemological and ethical ramifications of speculative posthumanism. The thesis that there could be agents originating in human socio-technical systems which become posthuman as a result of some technological alteration. Um, so clearly, these are both working along the lines that we've just heard of from, uh, from Peter and Ben. David also writes experimental fiction and concept horror. His novella Snuff Memories was published by Schism in 2021, and his new collection of fiction and theory fiction, Xenoerotics, is published this year also by Schism. So please welcome Nandita and David Roden. Thank you. 
I, uh, I said to Ed that I'm so mad at you for putting me after Peter Watts because I feel like the middle child in every family, you know, uh, kind of out, of out of my league. But um, thank you, Peter. That was uh, a great talk, and Ben did a great job uh, responding. So today I'm going to focus on recent calls by international actors for human-centered and so-called beneficial AI. A new proposal for global governance of AI based on international humanitarian law is being advanced under the banner of the Asilomar principle of beneficial intelligence, which aligns AI development with humanistic and human-centric values. Among the central issues that are the focus of this endeavor is the question of what set of values should AI be aligned with and what legal and ethical status should it have. Policymakers, non-governmental and international organizations, as well as academics and industrialists have begun to address the issue of how to govern AI and how to preserve the human-centeredness of machine-driven technologies. Global discourses have emerged around, quote unquote, meaningful human control. And philosophers now claim that robots can be designed to act ethically and should have rights. Contestations continue over ethical standards that assure the widest socioeconomic enjoyment of the benefits of AI across different populations. In sum, many, many unquestioningly continue to emphasize human centrism and human interventionism in their proposals for global governance of AI. Is the solution, however, simply to reaffirm humanism and humanistic principles? The answer is no. I'd like to take the opportunity to problematize some of the assumptions underlying humanistic designs for governing AI. I suggest that humanistic conceptions are based on asserting the priority of humans and deprioritizing non-humans as means to human ends. Normative approaches to human-centered artificial intelligence as such are limited and could be, in, and as we've seen, also dangerous potentially, and could be enriched and expanded by thinking anew about other ways of conceptualizing human-non-human -human contact zones, borrowing a term from Julieta Aranda's work. Discussions of ethical AI would benefit from confronting questions of whether non-human intelligences can be conceptualized in terms other than human or humanistic. The adoption of AI is escalating worldwide and data-driven advances based on AI are potentially transforming how work is carried out and how organizations strategize. Data-driven algorithms permit automation of cognitive, discretionary, and decision-making tasks that were earlier performed by human beings. Um, AI-driven automation tools are quickly replacing humans with algorithmic, algorithmic decision-making in organizations and social interactions. The growing presence of AI is making access and control of information a strategic objective of states, national governments, financial systems, digital commerce, and public struggles for power. While the promise of non-human intervention seems positive and advantageous to businesses, some warn that algorithmic decision-making has societal consequences that may not always be positive. There can be a difference between how business is benefiting and how society is benefiting. Despite its seemingly limitless potential, AI is also being deployed in technologies that create conditions for mass and micro-surveillance, cyber warfare, social control, as well as economic and informatic exploitation. This is one big reason that democratic nations, and the EU in particular, are trying to develop trusted AI systems based on ethical principles and on the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. The public sector's dilemma is that, on the one hand, it is purposed with protecting citizens from potential algorithmic harms. And on the other hand, it is driven to increase its own efficiency by adopting algorithmic systems. The double bind then is how to govern algorithms while being governed by algorithms. What makes algorithmic systems so appealing and distinct from other digital systems is their computing power, which exceeds human cognitive abilities 
and their ability to create autonomous knowledge without human supervision or oversight, as well as categorize traits and nudge behaviors. Here I want to focus on this element of human oversight because its various degrees, from total human supervision to no human supervision at all, defines the extent to which AI systems are said to be beneficial, that is, aligned with humanistic and human-centric values and under what has been called meaningful human control. For example, in practices of warfare, the development of autonomous weapon systems are phasing out human supervision in combat decisions. The use of what are called humans in the loop robotic weapons, that is to say robots that can select targets and deliver, deliver force only with human command, and human on the loop weapons, that is robots that can select targets and deliver force under the oversight of a human operator that can override its actions, are being set aside in favor of human off-the-loop weapons, robots that are capable of selecting and delivering force without any human input or interactions at all. By 2030, predictions are that fully autonomous weapon systems will be possible and that machine capabilities will have increased to the point that humans will not only become the weakest component in a wide array of systems and processes, but they will fade out of the decision-making loop entirely. But far from simply generating faster versions of existing behavior, some scholars argue that the widespread implementation of non-human intervention may prompt a new behavioral regime of non-human decision-making characterized by large numbers of sub-second extreme events and consistent with an emerging ecology of competitive machines featuring crowds of predatory algorithms. Attention emerges at this point that is worth exploring. How can the trend toward phasing out human oversight in AI-based systems be nonetheless still considered under the framework of meaningful human control? How is human control of AI systems conceptualized as more decision-making is transferred to non-human, especially algorithmic intervention? Otherwise put, how can humans continue to remain in the loop while simultaneously being re removed in favor of human out-of-the-loop systems. Even if we choose only to invest in beneficial AI, that is to say human-like AIs, this human orientation may only be superficial, aesthetic, surface-like, and therefore not powerful enough to overturn the propensity towards non-human decision-making. I take this opportunity to repurpose this terminology in the loop, on the loop, out of the loop, to speculate more deeply about what kind of assumptions underlie human-centric narratives about AI governance and human control of artificial intelligences. I speculate about what human control over AI means in three distinct contexts or scenarios. The first uh, is one in what I call humans in the loop, in which humans control non-humans and are therefore considered to be in the loop of control over all species and expressions of intelligence. The second scenario is humans on the loop, where humans cede mastery over non-humans, share control, and are considered to be on the loop with other species or intelligences. And finally, the third scenario, humans out of the loop, uh, in which humans are controlled by non-human intelligences and completely out of the loop of command. We see that humans in the loop and their perspectives are strongly anthropocentric, emphasizing human superiority and treating non-human intelligences as only instruments and means to achieve human ends. The second scenario, humans on the loop, by contrast, seek to deprioritize human-centric assumptions of mastery and hierarchy, instead emphasizing co-evolution and or co-individuation of humans and non-humans, affirming compatibilities and affinities between human animals, non-human animals, and machines, amongst other entities as well. Finally, humans 
out-of-the-loop perspectives prioritize non-human agencies, and anthropocentrism is devalued, deposed, and effectually jettisoned altogether. In these last two scenarios, control would have to be imagined in ways that do not involve human mastery over non-humans. Here is where we might find intellectual opportunities to think outside the normal, normative, conceptual box and begin to imagine human-non-human -human contact from perspectives other than human and other than humanistic. Questions of future governance, then, are entangled with socio-technical imaginaries in which data is becoming part of emerging forms of power relations. Although big data is emerging as a prevalent socio-technical imaginary, what exactly big data is remains a matter of debate. Data-driven scientific imaginaries do not just portray data science as a mere set of techniques and methods, but as a powerful force that must be harnessed and made to serve human needs. Although contemporary societies understand digital technologies to be important drivers of change, many would reject a deterministic view in which technology is imputed with agency, preferring instead to see technology as controlled by human agency, that is, the steady, cumulative, continuous expansion of human knowledge over nature. Nature, quote unquote. Thinking of the futures of governance in terms of in-the-loop perspectives thus entails conceptualizing humans as being governed by nomos or law. Such humans in the loop views prioritize the human element of oversight while pursuing whatever means necessary, including non-human interventions, to achieve desired outcomes. From business ethics to AI ethics, current discussions revolve around how to rethink and redesign ethics. This kind of humanitarian approach is a narrative that many find appealing. Cutting-edge technologies like AI that are harnessed by the power of human ingenuity. Many are turning to human rights by design, focusing on the ramifications of widespread deployment of AI for democratic governance and the enjoyment of human rights, to find ways to capitalize on the vast potential of AI for the benefit of humanity, while also protecting human beings and humanity as a whole from the downside risks. This ethics by design involves using nudges, norms, and laws to achieve desired outcomes like more ethical business practices or beneficial AI. Such humans in the loop socio-technical imaginaries envisage a future in which humans govern unpredictability through the instrumentalization of their rationality and their normative and norm-making capacities. From this perspective, AI and questions of automation in general are viewed in terms of human autonomy and oversight over non-humans. It's no surprise then that most applications of AI today that provoke notions of speed, quantity, flexibility, scalability, and extensity from self-driving cars and artificial neural networks to advertising and earthquake predictions are portrayed as giving humans the tools to control and navigate uncertainty and change. From such humans in the loop-oriented narratives, technologies are instrumental, and robots and AIs should remain tools of their human masters. Based on theories of human nature and moral autonomy that posit the sovereignty of human rationality, these in-the-loop perspectives privilege the production of knowledge that is human-centered, pri prioritize human mastery over non-human entities, and justify practices, including the use of animals in scientific testing, that lead to the instrumentalization of the non-human. A common feature of current AI discussions is the emphasis on retaining human oversight and control of unpredictable technological changes that threaten to untether humans from their traditional position as governors. The term cybernetics, or kubernetes, meaning governor or steersman, is originally in Plato's Gorgias. This idea of commanding 
or governing principle, became the seed idea for Norbert Wiener's conception of cybernetics, having borrowed the term directly from Plato, which extended the commanding principle to animals, including humans and machines. Cybernetics, according to Wiener, who got the idea from Plato, is the science of governance, namely the ability of a closed system to maintain its stability by constantly learning and adapting itself to changing circumstances. The principle of emergent governability, as such, has served as a normative tool for the production, implementation, and regulation of human-friendly, or so-called beneficial, AI technologies. The Asilomar imaginary of emergent governability and its idea of beneficial intelligence has been developing since the 1975 conference in Asilomar, California, when scientists and public officials assessed the risks of biotechnologies and discussed standards for the governance of bioindustries. As one scholar, Hurlbut, uh, argues, quote, Indeed, there have been a number of attempts to repeat history through reenactments, uh, reenactments of Asilomar, sometimes right down to the physical staging, in which Asilomar's retold plot lines are virtually always kept intact. That is to say, self-regulation by the scientific community contains public anxiety and engenders legislative restraint, thereby preparing the way for an orderly unfolding of a beneficent technological future." End quote. This humanistic and human-centric imaginary envisions the ethical governance of AI as the implementation of human ethical standards that promote the long-term interdisciplinary research necessary to document, understand, and shape AI to support human flourishing and democratic ideals. Their words, not mine. Scientific discourses thus dovetail with human-centric discourses in a variety of different ways to respond to the challenges of, gov of governing emergent technologies. Through the discourses of emergent governability and beneficial intelligence, the governance of artificial intelligence is asserted as the human mastery over non-human entities and is being used to manage issues pertain pertaining to the global regulation of economic, political, and social processes. And as Foucault showed, quote, calculations and tactics that allow the exercise of this very specific, albeit complex form of power, which has as its target population, and as its principal form of knowledge, political economy, and as its essential technical means, apparatuses of security, end quote. The Asilomar principle that undergirds the current portrait of, gov of governable beneficial AI, again to quote Foucault, sorry, this is not Foucault, to quote Hurlbut, draws together some ubiquitous features of late modernity, uncertainty, power, knowledge, technology, and rapid destabilizing change, and renders them coherent, orderly, and controllable. It is a simple fable for a complex age, one that promises predictability when the future is uncertain and renders uncertainty governable without friction." End quote. Emergent governability thus shapes not only how scientists and lawmakers envision their own roles and responsibilities in managing global problems, but also explains why human centrism and in-the-loop frameworks posit scientific self-regulation as key to a beneficent human future in which the threats and risks of artificial intelligence are managed and reduced by normative constructions of human control and containment of risk, what is referred to in debates of lethal autonomous weapons as meaningful human control, that is, the degree of human involvement in the critical functions of technology. Most philosophical and political discussions of ethical AI are still anchored in human-in-the-loop perspectives. While emergent governability is increasing the strategic importance of AI as a driver of future economics and geopolitics, discourses of ethical governance attempt to regulate AI in terms of the calculations about human benefit 
by focusing on juridical and normative solutions like cybersecurity policies and international regulations. Even while many argue that AI will develop ethically only by remaining founded in humanistic principles, many are pessimistic about the future benefits of AI. So what is the future in which we want to live? The Asilomar principles do not answer this question. They assume a generally valid and widely accepted consensus of a technically optimistic conception of the future, which on the one hand remains undetermined and, risks it and, run, and runs the risk due to a lack of socioeconomic analysis that only a few will determine it. But on the other hand, with the further pursuit of the technology path, uh, accepts AI as an inevitable fate. Taken together, the two already pose social threats to democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. As one scholar, Bartosz, argues in a 2018 policy paper, artificial intelligence has opened Pandora's box. It has the potential to undermine the logic of control. In the digital age, the tools of human thought may unfold an autonomous position that is powerfully directed against the impotent human being." End quote. The humans in the loop view is limited by its assumption that human-centric command assures a future of stability through institutional governance, namely the workings of the nation and interactions between nation states. In this view, the nation is imagined to be the legitimate actor on the world stage and where a widely shared sense of legitimacy can be found for the preservation of an ordered human future. The model of international political cooperation formed after the Second World War was founded on this imagined idea of political stability in which the cooperation of nation states solved international problems like inter and intrastate conflict. Over time, however, the centrality of the nation state has weakened, has dwindled with the emergence of global discourses that imagine legitimacy in terms of supra and transnational expert institutions that can oversee and respond to real-time global problems. As one scholar Miller suggests, globalism in the first instance is a form of scientific imagination that naturalizes and objectifies a range of technical understandings of global ecological and social processes and systems. Built around a new supranational model of global socio-technical surveillance and response, these institutions identify, frame, and seek to govern security problems on a worldwide basis, and thus seek to align political authority and organization with the underlying realities of global risk. The rise of globalism has been co-produced with novel technological systems that are themselves the products of human engineering in the 20th century, including technologies of observation, computation, visualization, communication, and transportation. Globalism thus transforms the earth from a place that people live to a set of global systems that they inhabit and shape, and that in turn imposes limits to which people must increasingly adapt themselves and their actions." End quote. Thus, the discourse of emergent governability, whether in the context of lethal autonomous weapons or artificial intelligence, still prioritizes meaningful human control and human oversight over human, non-human co-productions. The anthropocentrism of this approach is hard to ignore. Criticizing human centrism and its emphasis on hierarchy and mastery, the second scenario, humans on the loop, emerge to offer a different portrait in which humans co-evolve and co-produce, that is, share control with non-human entities like AIs under specific but changing environmental conditions, which are both within and beyond human control. Arguably, this is the viewpoint that is challenging the humans in the loop perspective today. Since humans on the loop discourses that emphasize more ecological, holistic, and egalitarian orientations 
are attracting attention as positive approaches for imagining, a pl a, imagining planetary futures. Governance becomes conceptualized not in terms of the ideals of human mastery, as in the in the loop perspective, but now in terms of a precarious but emergent governability that is conceived in terms of a precarious but shared existence between humans and non-humans. Humans on the loop perspectives then provide a way of imagining the co-production of scientific, scientific and humanitarian knowledge in terms of the co-production of human and non-human entities. Challenging the prevailing scientific imaginary and imagery that segregates species and privileges human-centric forms of life, more critically-minded scholars are arguing for a rejection of the principle of human mastery, or anthropocentrism, in favor of rethinking interspecies relationalities in terms of post-anthropocentric and post-human viewpoints that bridge the divides between human and non-human life. According to one scholar, Rosie Bradotti, quote, the relational capacity of the post-human subject is not confined within our species, but it includes all non-anthropomorphic elements. Post-anthropocentrism is marked by the emergence of the politics of life itself. Life, far from being codified as the exclusive property or the unalienable right of one species, the human, is now posited as process, interactive, and open-ended. The transversal force that cuts across and reconnects previously segregated species, categories, and domains. This vital interconnection posits a qualitative shift of the relationship away from speciesism towards an ethical appreciation of what bodies, human, animal, and others, can do. The new transversal alliance across, spe across species and among post-human subjects thus opens up unexpected possibilities for the recomposition of communities, for the very idea of humanity, and for ethical forms of belonging." End quote. Okay, well here, the emphasis on post-humanism rather, rather than humanism deprioritizes humans in the loop narratives in favor of humans on the loop viewpoints that privilege interspecies coevolution and co-production. Post-humanistic perspectives could thus be called post-human by design approaches and would emphasize post-anthropocentrism and post-humanism as a way of overturning the human as master narrative. Whereas humans in the loop perspectives make humans the creator and controller of technological change, post-humanist oriented ideas would claim that the human should remain an open-ended category and the product of ongoing processes of technological and anthropological development. The human is an ongoing product and outcome of technological change. So the in-the-loop assumption is overturned in favor of a post-human worldview in which change cannot be domesticated by human control. Post-humanists ask whether human societies can adequately keep pace with the historical rate of technological change, which seems to be increasing exponentially, arguing that technological transformations have led to the very alteration of the category of the human. Not only has the rate of technological innovation increased so as to have introduced a permanent state of innovation into human history, but the outpacing of human culture by accelerating technological change has utterly transformed the basic assumptions regarding human control and the instrumentalization of technology. To be sure, such relational, critical, post-humanists on the loop perspectives such as these are especially significant to discussions of ethical AI and should be and should be incorporated much more explicitly and emphatically into current global debates, especially in order to propose or imagine alternatives to the prevailing imagery that favors human by design approaches. The incorporation of post-humanistic discourses would be especially useful as a way of su supplementing 
current evaluations and speculations about the actual potential risks and benefits of AI by introducing questions of how AI technologies influence and reorganize power relations and how the norms of emergent governability may be shaped by visible and invisible power relations that may worsen rather than solve global inequalities and injustices. The relationality of the post-human approach is appealing, but it's not clear what role it can play in shaping global AI policies. It's unlikely that this post-humanistic perspective will have much power to influence global AI policy, as the human by design approach is definitely the prevailing one, and it will be very difficult to introduce post-human by design perspectives on AI without more advocacy and engagement. Moreover, vestiges of anthropocentrism remain in humans on the loop perspectives, despite their many appealing features. However, critics of this approach point out that co-evolution and co-production does not necessarily entail ceding human oversight altogether. And so the humans on the loop approach can often confer a special status to humans, retaining commitments to human centrism. Anthropocentrism is especially difficult to overturn completely when the intellectual resources that we use come from histories that are deeply embedded in humanistic ideas that give human animals a special status amongst other life forms. While in theory it may be possible to maintain conceptual distinctions be between both in-the-loop and on-the-loop perspectives, in practice, the strict distinction between these two perspectives is hard to maintain, and so-called ethical perspectives of every kind tend to find refuge in humanistic and human-centric ideals that promise a special status and role for humans. Neither in-the-loop nor on-the-loop perspectives, even the more critical alternatives, can claim to have explained why humans should expect to retain their special status amongst other non-human entities. So the task of conceptualizing a human out-of-the-loop perspective would fall to speculation and speculative thinking. In this scenario, implementing AI globally according to current standards and justifications would not be enough to overturn the socio-technical trends favoring AI-driven algorithmic computing and decision-making in all arenas of life. Whether one conceives of this as a scenario in which a superintelligence emerges, like in Bostrom, or not, the question of governance would have to address the question of how humans will conceive of governing or being governed, more likely, by AIs that have evolved beyond the capacities and powers of their own species, of the human species, that is. The challenge here would be to find a vision in which human-centric thinking and knowledge are not central. Anthropocentric thinking fails to be a good starting point for imagining futures that include humans, but that do not privilege them in any way. So this is where the contemporary conventional thinking about AI governance fails to provide an adequate framework, and where I suggest only the notion of the Zeno, from the ancient Greek meaning strange or alien, can serve as a speculative placeholder for framing that which replaces human-centric perspectives. The argument is that anthropocentrism might be phased out irreversibly in favor of the rule of non-humans, of non-human intervention or xenocratic governance. That is to say, ruling humans through non-human entities and controls. I suggest that this is truly where human-centric views of governance, whether they be in-the-loop versions of emergent governance, governability, or on the loop versions of post anthropocentric relationality, they give way to imagining non human governmentalities that phase out humanistic intervention and replace it with governance of the human beyond the horizon of the human, which is to say, alien governance or xenocracy. A human's out of the loop perspective would have to speculate about xeno intelligences well beyond human parameters, and as such, the problem of thinking through AI is that it requires a kind of thinking beyond empirical and normative levels, the is and oughts of 
artificial intelligence development to a level of speculation not addressed by empirical and normative concerns. Accordingly, a off-the-loop or out-of-the-loop perspective could be called a speculative posthumanism, a term coined by this fellow right here, by David Rodin in his excellent book, Posthuman Life, Philosophy at the Edge of the Human. Um, David Rodin provides a valuable intellectual resource with which to explore the possibility of the posthuman. Rodin defines posthumans as, quote, do you want to just read this since it's your, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Rodin defines posthumans as technologically engendered beings that are no longer human. Speculative posthumanism is a claim in which there could be posthumans, but in which there would be no need to introduce any normative justifications, moral or otherwise, since, as Rodin argues, the possibility of posthumans implies that the future of life and mind might not only be stranger than we imagine, but stranger than we can currently conceive. As Rodin writes, weakly constrained speculative posthumanism suggests that our current technical practice could precipitate a non-human world that we cannot yet understand, in which our values may have no place. Thus, while specul speculative posthumanism is not an ethical claim, it does raise philosophical problems that are both conceptual and ethical political. If our current technological trajectories might result in the world turning posthuman, how should we view this prospect and respond to it? Should we apply a conservative, precautionary approach to technology that favors human values over any possible post-human ones? Current discussions of AI ethics could certainly stand to ask such questions, especially in terms of Rodin's disconnection thesis. The argument that the human-post-human relation should be conceptualized not as a matter of the presence or absence of some essential human property, not as what he calls Lockean or Kantian persons, but as, quote, an emergent disconnection between individuals, which should not be conceived in narrow biological terms, but in wide terms, permitting biological, cultural, and technological relations of dissent between human and post-human, end quote. Here, human would not refer primarily to the human-centric portrait equated with biological and cognitive embodiments. That is, neither as real organisms nor as phenomeno phenomenological selves that have subjective experiences, but to a view that is disconnected from and independent of any human centrism. Posthumanism transforms the human by conceptualizing it outside the intellectual register of human flesh as functionally uh, instead as functionally autonomous assemblages, as Rodin writes, or simulacra, or hyper-realities, copies without originals, as in Baudrillard, that is, not as fleshy bodies, but as recombinant bodies. By way of such disconnectionism, anthropocentric authority and legitimacy are not only decentered and deconstructed, but moreover voided of any human centrism. Thus hollowed out, the concept of human becomes a construct, which it always was anyway, the, compon the components of which can be changed and manipulated to produce different effects and outcomes. Unlike humans in the loop perspectives or humanisms and on the loop perspectives, critical posthumanisms, in which anthropocentrism remains either in strong or weak forms, Speculative posthumanism, which I equate here with out-of-the-loop, off-the-loop views, repurpose the category of human by devaluing and then transvaluing the construct. Even gender and race become devalued and severed from humanisms and any framework based on prioritizing human agency. Bodies and bodily agencies break apart into multiplicities that can be combined, recombined, and reticulated in innumerable ways. In AI ethics debates, then, discussions revolve around human rights and whether rights should be accorded to non-humans. In these types of in-the-loop accounts, humans dominate and maintain dominance over other non-humans and AIs. 
Rights are designed according to human, humanistic concepts, frames, and norms. And personhood is the basis of universal human rights in the case of humanitarian discourses. And the moral superiority of humans and humanisms are presumed and made the legal and philosophical standard. In on-the-loop narratives, by contrast, humans coexist and co-evolve peacefully with non-humans and AIs. And human rights are extended to and conferred upon non-humans. But in out-of-the-loop standpoints, non-humans outrun and supersede human-centered norms and standards altogether. And there would be no attribution of basic rights because personhood would not be a key principle for framing and designing human AI relations. The emphasis on morality, moral standards, and normativity would be absent. And so new xeno-rationalities and xeno-affectivities would have to be invented and synthesized. Alien viewpoints become the bases for imagining relation, future relations. So in conclusion then, future discussions of AI should include speculations regarding future tendencies toward post-human interventionism, as I've argued here. The modern account of power if we follow Foucault, is largely the story of the transformation of power's automaticity. That is to say, power's ability to become automatic and autonomous, power's capacity to govern humans through the exploitation of its machinic properties. Power governs by exploiting its own post-human machinic tendencies. The machinic helps the economic converge with the technological and the social Machines advance economic rationality through technological innovation by cutting, the, by cutting the costs of human labor, labor by way of non-human decision-making mechanisms. What we are seeing today is a continuation of the development of power's automaticity, its growing reliance on machinic command, and its shedding reliance on human oversight. The post-human here is not conceptualized as a relation or merging of human with the machine, but rather as a widespread process of human adaptation and acculturation to non-human interventionism. So from the perspective that I've offered here today, current global discussions about ethical AI would benefit from more explicit consideration of post-humanist and speculatively or oriented approaches as they offer alternatives for ethical theorization from pan-cultural resources and narrative genealogies decoupled from strong anthropocentrism. Humans on the loop narratives acknowledge the entanglements between humans and non-humans and weaken strong anthropocentrism by upholding relationality, solidarity, and care as primary aspects of human-non-human -human associations rather than atomism, hierarchy, and mastery. But really, it is the humans out of the loop narratives that provide the best opportunities really to speculate about Zeno and other, and other than human-centered contexts, exchanges, and interfaces. Such Zeno theorizations may prove to be intellectually fertile for reimagining human AI contact. Thank you. Hello? Oh, yeah, now it's on. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for an absolutely exhilarating paper, um, Nandita. i thrilled to have one of my main sources here in front of me. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe this is a, a, a precipitately nice. an anthropocentric <laughs> approach <laughs> um, to dialogue. I mean, I, I, I was thinking... Um, you know, I, th I, 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 I was kind of staggered by your paper because I think these questions are, e are extremely hard to ask and sometimes almost painful to sort of follow through to the mm. degree that you have and you kind of wonder whether am I, you know, is this 
Am I crazy? Batshit oh. crazy. Yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, I do often wonder that. But I think... I, and, and I think my, my response at this point is to kind of... It's not, not to try and elaborate on, 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 on your extremely elegant and beautifully articulate discourse, but to just kind of reframe it, some of the questions, I, I, I guess, mm -hmm. in, in, in a way that... Um, well, I, I don't know. That will help me puzzle this stuff out because... As, as you rightly point out, um, post-human life and speculative post-humanism, perhaps unlike critical post-humanism, don't kind of emanate from an ethical uh, um, prospectus. Uh, I mean, in, when I wrote post-human life, uh, my main aim was to kind of sort out conceptually what the post-human could be and then kind of really in the final chapter to sort of frame the ethical problems that you, you've been exploring. But maybe we could begin by asking about anthropocentrism and mm -hmm. what, what might be wrong, what might be amiss with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so taking, you know... Um, so... One might ask, well, you know, is it so bad to, to be anthropocentric? After all, you know, you could argue that humans have many, you know, admirable qualities and capacities that we value, that, for example, those of us are in, who are in education spend our time cultivating. Mm -hmm. um, is there an ethical problem with it? it if you like, with imposing that framework on a, on a wider world, okay, if you like, instrumentalizing that world in order to cultivate human capacities. Mm. Now, that's the kind of the normative, a normative question that one could ask in relation to, the, uh, to, to anthropocentrism. I think, uh, and I wonder if this is a more interesting question and maybe goes, goes to the heart of what... The second is whether anthropocentrism actually is functionally viable? No. Yeah. because <laughs> <It's not. laughs> I think Because in a sense, if it's functionally viable, yeah. So, I, I, because, I mean, just to give you an example, is mm. it, 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 it the, 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 the distinction between humans on the loop, the mm. humans, sorry, in the loop mm. uh, um, framework and humans on the loop mm -hmm. implies that there is some perspective from which humans can kind of control their destiny. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just listening to Peter's talk mm -hmm. uh, before yours, one might argue that actually we haven't exhibited anything like that no. sort of uh, level of reflective, deliberative control over no. our future. In, quite, in fact, quite the opposite, that our, our very technological capacities have outrun our ability to control them. Yes. Regard and that's prior to the invention of AI. So yes. I just wondered if you had any yes. thoughts about the, the kind of slippage from the, the normative to, if you like, the, the kind of speculative, speculative or functional yeah. status of, of, of the human here. Well, that's why I call these narratives. Yeah. Because they really don't have anything to do with reality, mm. as Peter beautifully showed us. Mm. They are the ways we think about ourselves, or as Ben mm. said, that's the, the ways we think about ourselves mm. thinking, yeah. you know, ourselves as mind. So these are, this is a construct mm. that has masqueraded as philosophical truth mm. for millennia. And so, and, and when I was writing this piece, I really had to struggle to come up with the right word. I, you know, I, I looked at other words, mm. I, you know, maybe category or, you know, some kind of, you know, word like that. But really, in the end, it came back to these are narratives. Mm. These are the ways that we construct stories about our, mm. you know, ourselves, about humanity and about human supremacy. Mm. Um, and so... Really, I see each of these scenarios as, as constructs. They're, they're narratives that we mm. 
Now the first one in the loop is, is the one that we have, we're stuck in. Mm. We're, stuck in it, we're stuck in it now, but I think that it's slowly starting to loosen up with uh, challenges mm. to this narrative. But my point is that the challenging narratives, the critical narratives are still, they still, although they claim to be post-anthropocentric, mm. they are not. And so I, I, I take this, po this kind of emphasis on post-anthropocentrism to also be a narrative. Mm. So the idea is that now instead of valuing anthropocentrism, let's bring up an, another term, post-anthropocentrism, mm. and let's put some value on that. Now, it's a, good, it's a good maneuver, but the problem is still, I think, that... Um, there are vestiges of anthropocentrism mm. in this. And, and, and specifically, they're still anthropocentric, weakly speaking, because they still give a special status mm. to human beings. Human exceptionalism is not drained away completely. So, you know, it was such a fortuitous thing to happen upon your book because, mm. and I'll, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be sycophantic, Maybe you'll buy me a drink afterwards, I don't know, but <laughs> a bottle of wine now. But, um, you know, your book is really the first one that set posthumanism uh, in its, I guess, rightful place as something truly different, something that truly um, disconnects itself from anthropocentrism. Now, so, so this is why I've sort of really... I've felt that your notion of speculative post-humanism has been really helpful for me to um, to find a a scenario which doesn't simply replicate the problems of uh, the on the loop point of view. Yeah, I mean, just thinking a little more about on the loop um, scenarios. I was really, fa you know, I was really fascinated by the slippages here because, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what what interests me is the assumption that somehow um, involvement of humans in some kind of I don't know transversal space of zo I don't know zoophilic affiliation, as, as Bray Dossie as argues, says. is somehow inherently virtuous. Um, one could argue that that already characterizes our relationship with the kind of non-humans that form part of what I call the white human, which is just, you know, the extended socio-technical mm -hmm. shell that we mm -hmm. as cultural, cult, enculturated animals surround us with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that that, that is at best arguably morally neutral. It's, it's uh, from our perspective, it confers certain benefits, but it's, it's, it's also in many places disastrous and perhaps burning through the, burning through the planet, as Peter pointed out. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, that, that kind of co-evolutionary process, is, in a sense, you could argue, is normatively moot. It, 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 it's a descriptive rather than an ethical oh, that's category. Yeah. Uh, and the assumption that somehow transversality is, really is anything more than a kind of ontological or uh, mm -hmm. structural feature seems to be prob deeply problematic. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I, I would argue it's simply something that we have to deal with, yeah. especially in, in a modern, in, yeah. in, in modernity. But, simply because of the connectedness and the globalism that you've been yeah, talking about. Yeah. I don't know what you think about I that. absolutely, I mean, I, I, I do agree, and, and I would even go so far as to say that, unfortunately, I don't cre credit Bradotti with the idea either, because in some senses, you know, if we look at the work of Gilbert Simondon, mm. who was a French mechanologist, as he mm. called himself, uh, in, you know, in the... 1960s, 50s, 60s, uh, 80s, uh, 70s, uh, etc., had already come up with a, a kind of different way of looking at um, the human in relation to its wider associated milieu mm. and in relation to technical objects. So, mm. 
if you read Simon Don, you already have a description sure. of a completely different um, relational ontology mm. than, um, although it's funny because he, he was a humanist. Mm. He was a self-declared humanist, but uh, I think that if you look at Simon Don's work, you already have what Bredotti is talking about mm. um, in her work now. Sure. So I do agree that it is somewhat descriptive, uh, but for the purposes of this paper, mm. I sort of wanted to depict them as narratives. Yeah. yeah. I always like to imagine that Simon Don is one of the few philosophers you could imagine philosophers of technology you could imagine actually being able to mend your fridge or <laughs> mend your television set. Well, I don't know. doubt it. He, yeah. was, he actually did that himself. Apparently, he would lovingly tend to his machines and, you know, if they broke, he would not discard them. He would, wow. you know, he'd, he would try to fix them and reuse yeah. them and he had great respect for the technical objects and entities that he that he was around, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice man, I think. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, most of us just kind of blather about mm -hmm. this stuff without actually um, yeah, understanding yeah, it. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going back, I suppose sort of going forth perhaps to thinking about the, 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 the speculative post-human. Um, I guess if we, even if we kind of bracket whether transversality and interspecies connection or into this kind of ontological externalization or relationality, should we say, mm. is somehow an inherent good. Um, if, it's, if it's kind of unavoidable, mm. if, if in a sense we're like yeah. uh, fleas on the back of this cat, Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to kind of scrambling to kind of keep up with its uh, it, it, its various its evolution or yeah. to kind of, sorry mix, let's use the mixed metaphor but um, we, we're inhabiting this this system that we we, we are at best contributing to yeah. mod, to modulating and uh, changing without necessarily being able to control mm -hmm. it um, the question is what and if we assume that in a sense the human, as you said, is a construct, mm -hmm. so we're constantly modifying ourselves, for example, um, back in, uh, um, I think it was the, towards the end, uh, an animal, the invention of animal husbandry probably um, selected certain groups of humans for lactose tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the sort of before, before, um, before kind of humans became um, sedentary or became uh, uh, city dwellers. Um, the fact that we have parts of the brain that seem to be dedicated to processing script is a cultural adaptation to the technique of writing. It's mm -hmm. not something we, we even evolved yes. for. So there are lots of That's ways right. in which we've modified ourselves yes. historically and we, yes. we're continuing to do that. So yes. perhaps the human is, if, if you like, at best, a mass term rather than a, a sort of essence, a, a description of a kind of lump that Indeed. is constantly changing. Now, if that's the case, then obviously we're in a process, and we're in a process of accelerated change. Then, mm. how do we think ethically about creatures, our future descendants, including ourselves, mm -hmm. who may? in a sense, see the world and experience the world in fundamentally different ways. Mm -hmm. and, how, and how can we, in a sense, construct forms of governance which don't, in a sense, preempt those ethical frameworks with ethical frameworks which actually may not be appropriate right. for the worlds that we are constructing? Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the central questions, I think. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, the, the easy answer, I guess, is that we have to first recognize how much our conception of the human is very much um, oriented around this very deep-seated and long-established presumption mm. that humans are superior to uh, 
non-humans because of their capacity for reason, mm -hmm. speech, um, you know, all the, 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 the good mm -hmm. logos and all the, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that, the, that Aristotle and Plato talked about. Sure. So this idea of prioritizing human life over other life is, I suppose, where we might start. Yeah. And that's why I kind of get what Bredotti's doing. Like, there is a value in doing sure. that because she is trying to loosen that, yeah. um, that presumption. I think that's where speculative and critical post-humanism intersect. They do. Yeah, they definitely. do. They do. And I think that in some senses, I would see critical post-humanism as a scaffold. Sure. It's almost like a midpoint, you know, a jumping off towards speculative mm. post-humanism. Um, but that, you know, you've got to take that dive. <laughs> you can't just stay on yeah. the diving board. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm really... I'm very, I hope we can keep talking because, yeah, sure. yeah it's been a, a real pleasure. It's been a blast. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> Take that with you. Take that with you. Thank you so much, Nandita and David. Um, we just, uh, we have to keep moving as we're running a bit late. Um, but that's okay, because we have enough time for our symposium and panels. So I'd love to introduce Julieta Aranda and uh, invite her to talk. Julieta is an artist, an editor of EFLUX Journal, and co-director of the EFLUX online platform since 2003. In her artistic practice, she composes sensorial encounters with the nature of time and speculative literature. She observes the altering human-Earth relationship through the lens of technology, artificial intelligence, space travel, and scientific hypothesis. Working with installation, video, and print media, she's invested in exploring the potential of science fiction, alternative economies, and the poetics of circulation. Her projects challenge the boundaries between subject and object while embracing chance encounters, auto-destruction, and social processes. Thank you, Julieta. Thank you so much. Um, hello. Uh, yes, this works. Um, just let's see that I am coming up. Um, bueno, me presento en español porque hablo español, pero después eh, el, el texto que les voy a leer y los videos que les voy a mostrar, lamentablemente están en inglés. Pero si hay preguntas o lo que sea, puede ser todo en español. Um, okay, so um, before I start talking, I want to show um, a video. It's the second part of a series of three videos of which I show the first one during the closed, the closed sessions. So um, uh, this is called uh, Swimming in Rivers of Glue. Uh, ah, claro, claro, claro. Okay, I think now we are in business. Okay, so you. Uh, yikes, come on, come on. Show me, show me. And the full screen. No. No, Dios, no. Okay, yes, okay. Ah. High-tech gendered imaginations are produced here. Imaginations that can contemplate the destruction of the planet 
and a sci-fi escape from its consequences. Space travellers are just constantly losing and refinding their own room, shrinking their space and recovering their expansiveness. The job of a space traveller is to escape. Perhaps that's the ultimate luxury, for escape to become a profession. bubble here, but even an economic imaginary requires real human bodies to test the spaces that are being imagined. Ugly cities have great futures. No, not us. We pass. This is not a matter of us and them. We pass for the city infrastructure. saying that distance is dead, that this is the end of distance. architecture, artifacts, traffic.
it is different now. We are approaching a new Wild West period for humanity. Our temporality is future-oriented, and progress demands new skills, new language. The elderly are like hard drives in old dying formats. Yeah, like floppy disks or magnetic tape. But isn't that what formats are? Forgetting? Similar to language, old and new English? Change doesn't come from things, but from the way things are done.
Okay, all right. Where are you? Mm? Oh, come on, I just have you here. Ah, here it is. Okay. So now I'm going to try to put this together with um, another text about um, excess output. Um, just let me make this a little bit bigger because I'm blind. View. Uh, how do I make you bigger? Like this. Okay. Um, arguably, the first poem written in outer space was written by the crew of Skylab 2, an infamous group of astronauts who went on strike during, during the 1970s because they felt that they were overworked and wanted more time, as they put it, to contemplate the universe. The poem is not particularly good, but it's still um, worth listening to. Um, um, uh, so it goes, uh, for the 80 MPIs and the SAR and all those people, it's a final debriefing from the Skylab crew. Oh, our mugs were filled with baths of solar science, while a Velcro strap was holding down our ramps. As with MPC in hand, the monitor we scanned, we were tracking down some dark and bushy clumps. Yes, we had dreamed of active region 7-7, till the panels worn our fingers down to stumps. And there ain't but one phenom that you could always glom. They are bushy, they are dark, and they are clumps. Now, if suddenly the flare alarm goes crazy, and in Solv, it said LV, it looks like Sol has got the mumps. Forget X-ray, forget plague. That stuff is not for the mirage. Fix your eye upon the dark and bushy clumps. Then, afterward, we'll, we'll sit around the table to look at all the film and take our lumps. And they will say, why did you leave tone light enabled? We got 50,000 frames of bushy clumps. Um, so, uh, this had to do, of course, with a time when they were still using photographic film to uh, do all the recordings and the image uh, tracking in space. And those 50,000 frames, with, which now are, I mean, I think we all have 50,000 images in our cell phones. In any case, in, at that moment, 50,000 frames of something were a lot. That was excess output. And, uh, what I think of excess, excess output, output is that it is the unexpected outcome of design. Outputs that are not calculated in the original, but that nonetheless enter the culture and the social imaginary. So if bushy clumps were the excess output of the 1970s, the excess output of the present takes different forms. As the digital sphere becomes incorporated, both are becoming corporeal and corporate, a virtual geography starts to become apparent. It does no, it, this geography does not intend to function as a one-to-one -one representation of real space or to become a, a virtual equivalent of reality. It is not defined by contiguous space, nor is it defined by the standard markers of the nation state, race, religion, language, colonization. Rather, it is structured around notions of profit and it doesn't limit itself to the physical sphere. It cuts into both personal space and time and time, extracting information and monitoring your geolocation in the process of defining itself and its own boundaries, curtailing the potentiality of the medium and not quite obsolete authority enters into operation. Instead of a seamless World Wide Web, we are faced now with the creation of artificial borders, the corporate sandboxing of the digital sphere. And I guess that's something that happened as the internet of the 90s, uh, which was all open and allowed uh, you know, the possibility of uh, all contact, all access, uh, started to become the internet that we have today, and things like the Great Firewall of China um, came into being. Um, mm -mm. 
to, 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 um, yeah. How do digital borders manifest? They manifest in the sandboxing of devices made by Apple, prohibiting the use of ter third party apps and penalizing the jailbreaking of iPhones, or in China's internal policy determ determining the bounds of Google. These invisible borders were also apparent in January 2014, when cell phone users in Ukraine, who happened to be near the scene of the Maidan clashes in Ukraine, received text messages saying, Dear subscriber, you are registered as a participant in a mass riot. Willingly or not, these users crossed the border between the good and the bad Kiev, between the good and the bad internet. Through social media, Though social media was hailed as the enabler of the Arab Spring, the millions who took to the streets achieved no political gains, and in the wake of Snowden's revelations, an even darker picture of, corporate, of a corporate surveillance-driven internet began to emerge. Displacing and complicating the image of the internet as a space of limitless, possi limitless possibility, the World Wide Web, like the Lacanian mother, was split in two. There is a good internet based on communication and community, and there is now, too, the bad internet, a tool of corporate surveillance, trolling, and political punishment. If digital space is a territory in its own right, its mapping is not happening with Borgesian fidelity. The interests that are trying to describe this territory are not concerned with accuracy or diversity nor are they interested in the imaginary. In old maps, unknown lands were often inhabited by fantastical beings, sea serpents, monstrous beasts, mermaids. In the most widely circulated maps of the virtual world, however, digital topographers labored to create a homogeneous landscape where a user is a user is a user, disregarding the social and cultural accidents and filling in the unknowns with replicas of the topographers themselves. In her seminal essay, The Cyborg Manifesto, Donna Haraway argues that the effect of a digital ontology is the effacement of all oppositions. Instead of firm dichotomies, the distinction between human and animal, organism and machine, and physical and non-physical, becomes increasingly leaky. Everything becomes nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, a section of a spectrum. The digital frontier once carried the promise of a post-political condition, free of agonism and struggle, an economy of abundance is instead of an economy of scarcity. But so far, this dream has been but a weak utopia, unable to shake itself of the 20th century. The frictionless space of perfect technological reception is a first world effect. The conditions in which innovation is produced have nothing to do with the conditions into which innovation is deployed. We can also put it in the famous words, uh, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Which I believe is Gibson. Digital devices double as control mechanisms. Their production is thus dependent on the decimation of digitally underrepresented regions. As this new geography displaces the old, the digital subject becomes more visible than the physical subject. While the circulation of celebrities, luxury goods, liberal professionals, tourists, and financial flows occupy the field of visibility, refugees, seasonal workers, immigrants, and illegal aliens are rendered invisible. What does the future look like for those lacking digital representation? And what does it look like for those who are overrepresented, the digitally obese, let's say? If the conditions under which I exist are too precarious for me to be considered a user in this new landscape, I may be destined to ex for extinction, or I may already be extinct, part of a barren, obsolete present that will soon be discontinued. But it may be that the constitution of this subject is not yet fully graspable, and that in the rush to create conditions for its viability, we have neglected to generate the tools to understand the atomized psychological space that she inhabits. If subjectivity was a function of private property, what happens when all the frameworks of ownership are incorporated? Even though the digital, 
even though the digital obeys physical laws that are located within the material world, digital bodies are not fully recognized by legal systems of rights and account accountability. And there is an ever-widening gap between how the treatment of a subject is prescribed and how it is constructed. Take for, take for example, the institutionalized person who has to surrender her digital devices and is forced to interact only with her real contacts, even though her relationships are dependent on being able to reach those very contacts to the same devices that are being taken away. This atomized space imbues device, devices with an affective quality, akin to the transitional objects of a subject whose heteroaffective other is not necessarily human. The selfie is no longer analogous to a self-portrait, but functions rather as some kind of degraded mirror stage for this child of technology that sees the internet as her mother. The logic of old media temporality was color-coded. Contemporary Africa was black and white, just like Dickensian England. To boot, the third world's present belongs to the first world past. In the diffuse world of post fordist economies, all matter is in permanent motion and all temporalities are spatialized. Online, every social form gets to have a second life. Everything is an image and all images are up for grabs. The space race has been revived as an extension of digital incorporation. But the fantasy of a cultural totality is full of cracks and the increasingly pervasive vectors of global communication are by far more chaotic than one would care to, to suggest. Our imaginative capacities are currently limited to the planetary domain. This limit is a defining, of <clears throat> is a defining characteristic of reimagining capital with any kind of horizon uh, uh, for real-world application. Therefore, the question of post-planetary capital, of modes of escape, of new models of capital, of the ultimate excess output, cannot be about real-world application. It does not demand a new economic theory. It does not demand an ethical horizon. It has no political project. It doesn't even require oxygen or humans to survive. This might be depressing for those who demand a structural, ethic, juridical horizon for political thought, not to mention for those of us who like to breathe. But let's not get depressed yet. If post-planetary capital renders any structural demands <coughs> instantly obsolete, it privileges demands that are speculative in nature, those constituted by the imagination. They are, and can only be, demands that assume the voice used in fiction. They can only be projective. If there are criteria for such a form of capital, they would measure the scope of its imaginary, the breadth of the universe that it can account for and accommodate in its projection. The game with this form of capital concerns can <coughs> the game with this form of capital concerns what can be imagined as its resource. But perhaps the question gives its own answer. We all know these questions are always asked. <coughs> by people who get off wanking over the grave of the humanist project after a night at the bowling alley. But what, what if we follow the bowling ball? Any sincerely post-humanist or, or post-planetary capital must be pegged to a base that does not and cannot concern or, or be experienced by humans. So while a post-planetary capital needs to be pegged to the limits of imagination, it also, at the same time, can't be pegged to imagination at all. It is, by necessity, incomprehensible to us. And one second. We are already... What did I do here? We are already inside a world constituted by post-planetary capital. Post-planetary capital is recursive. It feeds back on itself. It is finance. This is how high-speed trading works. It is a mistake of literalism to think that, we, that, that beyond the planet is only outer space. <clears throat> there, is, there are already post-planetary populations occupying space beyond the planet and in, inhabiting it as a place with an economy of its own, one that is completely exchangeable with those of still planetary beings. An inflation crisis is brewing deep in China's spirit world, one that would, be, that would give central bankers chills. Inflation is everywhere, so of course it happens in the underworld too. And during uh, Queen Ming Festival, 
millions of Chinese people visit graveyards where their ancestors are buried. During this visit, they burn both hell notes, which is paper money, and cardboard replicas of luxury goods. According to Chinese folklore, money can buy you happiness in the afterlife. Traditionally, this just money is <clears throat> known as ghost money, and it came in small denominations of fives and tens. But more recent generations of money printers have grown less restrained. The value of the biggest bills has risen in the past few decades from the millions and more recently, like in Zimbabwe, the billions and trillions. The reason? Even Hong Kong's dead are trying to keep up with the Joneses. And their living relatives believe that they need more and more fake bucks to pay for high-cost indulgences like condos and iPads. Economists say that the problem is that the underworld has no control over how much currency enters its economy. The more ghost money burned, the more inflation continues to, so to zoom upward. If it's money supply that's what's causing the problem, one wonders if, like Zimbabwe, the underworld should not tolerate his econo its economy and begin accepting U.S. currency. This would not solve the problem of scarcity in the underworld. Who, for example, is providing the paper iPads for the Hong Kong Neanderthals, whose bloodlines have disappeared? But it might at least reduce the amount of cash flowing into the spirit world. This underworld is not a criminal underworld, although in a way they are on it too. This is an economic space where the metaphor rubs up against the referent, where the criminal underworld produces the currency of the dead without any need for oxygen. <clears throat> if the limit point of our imagination is marked by feedback loops, we can also map where the question of a post-planetary capital lapses into a desire for another idealist absolute. But we know that idealist absolutes are only so because of how they hide their economy. They hide their contingencies and they hide their logics of exchange. A post-planetary capital that claims to supersede the human will always be revealed, just like finance capital, to be pegged to the human. Um, any projective revision of ethical and political horizons has to take space and terrestrial limits into account. Um, so, uh, so, so this um, uh, political. I'm sorry. Um, any projective uh, revisions? Yeah, yeah. The only problem with this taking. Um, uh, space and terrestrial limits into account is that, that it's very easy to then conflate space with religion and God and consequently turn this, the quest for space into a crusade. Space and God are conflated when a space is posited as a place where speculation can occur in the absolute, which is to say, superseding the terms of an actual economy. This equation of space with heaven, with the welfare state, with any kind of equivalence that ignores the terms of exchange or that claims to supersede all contingencies. This heaven business should not distract us from the question of what it is that we want. Um, we don't want the absolute, we don't want God, we don't want narrow totalities. But madness is not so bad. Madness can allow us to bypass quests for the monadic purity of an absolute world and give way to a fertile set of worlds. A promiscuous exuberance where three million year old fist sized amoebas can have sex with the bones of my unborn children. The mirror stage is part and parcel of arriving at consciousness. But we also get past it. It's part, it that is part of growing up. At this point, the fact that there is a mirror apparent in the post planetary project is only signaling the limits of our imagination. But how isn't asteroid mining? a mirror of the Congolese coltan mines. What kind of post-planetary conflict is asteroid mining going to finance? The most interesting question here is not how to sustain the well-trodden territories that we have created at planetary level in anaerobic conditions, but rather how to get past this mirror and peg post-planetary capital to space and time. That's it.
Hey, everybody. So I understand um, only now that the translators apparently have to leave, and we won't have time for a full panel here at the final discussion. Um, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to have a bit of a conversation. So what I'd like to do is in invite Peter and Nandita and David up, but we have to be really, really focused. We have to be super, super focused um, and not go over, I think, the next 10 minutes on this conversation. How's that? That sounds good. Okay. I just spoke a lot, so. Did I go over time? No, you, you didn't go over. We were just running very late. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hello. Yep, there you go. These seats are really comfortable, no? Yeah, you go for go for that. So, uh, again, we have to we have to be really more focused than we usually are, so that we we crank through this so quickly. But I want to kick it off by picking up on a point, um, Julieta, that you made during your one of your videos. Yeah, uh, you said morality is part of a fitness function, mm -hmm. and nothing is more immoral than dying or failing to survive. And you link that to the concept of surviving, leading to exploration. How good. And you. you concluded Thank by you. asking us to reimagine the horizon of capital at the planetary scale or the post-planetary scale. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I'm in the lucky position where I can tie a kind of a thread between everyone's presentations, in part because I've known most of you for, for such a long period of time. <laughs> um, but also because in the past four days, through these conversations and the round tables, I think we've seen how all of these threads connect. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that this idea of morality being part of the fitness function links back all the way through all the talks to Peter, mm -hmm. to the questions that you raised, mm -hmm. and in the conversation with Ben Bratton. Mm -hmm. So the question here would be, not only for organic life, but for non-organic life, artificial life and artificial intelligence, how do we define morality? Or how do we separate morality from the fitness function? Because I think, Peter, you, you covered this territory pretty intensely. And so maybe I'll ask you to just kick off with a, I don't know, this is horrible, but like a one-liner that shatters us all. <laughs> Go. Um, morality is bad. <laughs> morality is, is the elevation of a gut feeling to some kind of exalted ethical status. Morality is, you know, Dad Bernard Murtha, that just ain't natural. You know, it's, you know God, God intended marriage to be between a man and a woman. That's morality. That's gut prejudice um, codified. I, dis I distinguish that from ethics, which is, it, it grapples much more coherently with questions like, you know, if killing 10 saves 20 is a deal. Um, ethics has a sort of a more cognitive basis, whereas I think morality is, is just animalistic gut instinct with a veneer of respectability that we've all kind of agreed to pretend is there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Nandita. So, oh, you have, you have your headphones on. Do they uh, speak? Oh, I do. Yeah, I you do, do have, okay. yeah. So, in the loop, on the loop, out of the loop, this idea of morality being part of the fitness function, which made it stick around in us. I mean, that was the point that you were making, is we have morality because it worked as a fitness function across millions of years of evolution. Yeah, but so, not that I agree with it, no? Oh, I, I know. I understood that. I, underst yeah. I understood that. Yeah, yeah. It's not that morality is an end goal that we should strive towards necessarily. But remember but, the Spanish yeah. Inquisition? Morality has killed a lot of people. Sure. So, you know, um, I guess it's a matter of perspective, the perspective of perspective. But morality is kind of a projection, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like one person's gut feeling as dogma. projected yeah. outward, and then other people are just stupid enough to believe it. Yeah. I, I think, Julia, you, 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 uh, you nailed it. You asked for a one-liner. Yes. She, she gave you one yep. in, in yep. one of those videos. Like, 
morality essentially is a survival impulse. Right. It, it, everything else arises from me, me, me. It's a selfish gene survival impulse. That's all it is. Well, if we strip away the survival impulse, one of the things that Peter talked about in an earlier workshop was the idea of distributing a body or a consciousness across such a wide field that it wouldn't have the same relationship to the impulses for survival that you or I have because our bodies are what we live in and if they don't survive then you or I as individuals don't survive. And so I'm wondering if there's a way through a refigured notion of self or not a refigured notion of the human but a refigured notion of the limits of self where morality and ethics could be either dispensed with or properly reinvented. And, you know, I think, Peter, your talk was getting at that. I wonder if I could bounce this back to David for a, a thought on that reconfiguration of morality and ethics. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not clear on whether morality is a sort of adaptation, um, but, you know, that it's kind of, in some sense necessary related to survival after all our moralities often enjoin us to do things which are kind of contrary to our welfare yeah. Yeah. Um, but others welfare yeah or others welfare uh, as in, in a sense that, that so mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a debatable point you know just to what extent there's selection for certain kinds of um, cooperative behavior and how that's reflected in formal morality I guess uh, what I'd suggest is that any kind of agency implies some sort of self-maintaining capacity and some kind of attempt to harvest options out of whatever environments one's, one's in. And obviously in an accelerating situation of accelerating technological change, tho those those challenges and options are multiplying. So in a sense, the ethical in this context becomes maximizing your power, your capacity to affect and be affected, which may not conform to any standard kind of moral dispensation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like we're facing that as, as the horizon of our potentiality right now, not just the horizons of capital in a planetary, post-planetary framework, but we're facing that as the horizon of, of what we will be as we design potentially artificial superintelligence. And the concept of whether you build a limbic system into it or not, Peter, it seems to me is linked to the question of morality as a kind of a survival fitness function that came along for the ride simply because it enabled some set of species to manage to continue a little bit better than others at least in whatever evolutionary framework we're talking about. I, I would like to throw a fitness function, uh, an ethical universal fitness function out there for, yeah. for response. Everything ultimately has to rest on, it, on some kind of axiom that's unprovable. You just have to accept it, right? We have a gut desire to persist, to survive, to send our information into the future. Uh, we, also have an informa uh, we also have a universe that is heading for heat death maximization of entropy. I would argue that if you're going to accept that as axiomatic that you want to continue not necessarily your own existence but the existence of the universe for as long as you can because it's decaying. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to stop universal decay you want to slow the increase of entropy the way you in slow the increase of entropy is take that one giant fire hose of thermodynamic progression and you split it into a bunch of micro capillaries. This is what the evolution of life does. Exactly. It doesn't reverse entropy because nothing does, but it slows entropy. And so I would argue that anything that extends the ultimate lifespan of the universe is good. Mm. Anything that shortens the lifespan of the universe is bad. The thing that, uh, that we know of that extends the lifespan of the universe is increasing structural complexity because that puts the brakes mm -hmm. on, on, um, on, on 
entropic decay. decay. So, and the way we know of, at this point, to maximize informational complexity and structural complexity is through a biosphere that has as many diverse and different links as possible. Mm -hmm. a, a planet covered with one species is bullshit. Its, it's entropy is actually uh, quite high or quite, I guess actually it's low, isn't it? Because entropy is the amount of information it takes that to describe a complete system. Mm -hmm. So forget that part. <laughs> and pretend that I stopped talking 30 seconds ago, <laughs> and I think that's pretty profound. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I'm reminded of a cheesy line from the film The Fifth Element, where the aliens, uh, you know, they are about to be trapped in a tomb in, somewhere in Egypt, and, oh, one, yeah. and one of the humans says, come, come, my lord, you know, there's still time for you to get out, and the alien says, you know, sort of ponderously, time not important. Only life important. Yeah. So I suppose on the longest timeline to go against Tyler Durden, the most mm -hmm. important thing is the increase in complexity to preserve structure, dissipative structures, which might be sometimes living, but might be sometimes very far from what we normally would consider to be life. Yeah. No, if somebody comes up with a fractal crystal that, that accretes and grows inorganically, but at the same time in a non-repetitive way, that might be a candidate, but then may, that might also be alive. Somebody's got to say something. How about viruses? Neither dead nor alive. <laughs> David? Yeah, I, I guess the, the problem with life is life, uh, living things export entropy. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. just by eating stuff and using resources. So I, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about halting universal entropy. Um, but... But um, it's certainly, I, I guess we certainly create complexity, which we don't have to measure simply in terms of um, disorder. We can measure it in other ways. Or so, is it that create, complexity yeah. creates us? Yeah. But isn't that what, uh, isn't that what entropy literally is as a, as a function? It's, it's the amount, like, a random cloud of gas requires an enormous amount of energy to describe it because each particle needs to be specified individually in three dimensions, whereas a crystal, if you know how one part of that crystal works, you can predict it to, you can predict the rest of the, the structure because it is repeating. So it has a, it has a low entropy, um, the ra random cloud of, of chaotic moving gases has a high entropy because it requires a lot of information. So the lower the information required to describe the system is what you're going for. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I jump in here for two reasons? I have a thought, and we have to wrap. Okay. So if you'll permit me, Please. with your good graces. Yeah. This reminds me of something Schrodinger said in What is Life? Crystalline structure of DNA before they understood what DNA was. And Schrodinger speculated there might be a crystalline structure from which the processes of life would proceed, mm -hmm. and that it would have something to do with managing entropy. So we can go back to Schrodinger's text, What is Life, mm -hmm. and think about crystalline structures and entropy. Okay. We probably could make a great link to crystalline structures of time through Deleuze. Yes. We could even have some crystals underneath our massage table because it might make us feel better. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, fourth dimension, time crystals, there's a connection there too. Exactly. <laughs> but in any case, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around thank late. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Matadero for hosting us for a week and hey. letting us run late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Gracias. you, Mandita, David, Peter, Julieta, Bonnie Bersadna is still with us, Thank everyone who joined us, Ben Bratton. Uh, I think David and I are going to snatch our cubic centimeter of time Yay. to play some exit music for you while you wander Can't out. Wait. And hopefully you have a wonderful evening tonight on Can't Saturday wait. in Madrid. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Hyperreal X-ray image, Aperon, desaturated hyperrealism, photoreal silver gelatin print 8K. Um, this is not exactly the most high fidelity generative AI, uh, but it's super fast, it's super fun to work with. One other thing about the workflow with this is you can, you can channel any application into the window. So you can be working in Photoshop or anything you really want to at all, and you'll be getting three to five frame per second updates in generative AI. Anyway, what David and I had talked about doing is looking for ways that gesture capture with the sound can get integrated with generative AI in real time. This tool came out like a week and a half or two weeks ago. Um, and we were lucky enough to get it to work in the past couple of days. Not that this workflow is very difficult because it's really just screencasting. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about whether we would try to do something more explicit with the gestures in front of the webcam. But because it's only one to three frames per second, it's not really capturing very much. And sometimes it's quite lurid, you know. I mean, it kind of looks cyberpunk in a very, you know, kind of crazy way. Um, the conversation that we had went very deep around the questions of what it would mean for in the next generation of AI in the coming, you know, 12 to 18 months for us to be able to rethink tokenization of sound and gesture together. So in the conversation around multimodality, what does it mean to be a practicing musician, someone who moves with their body, who has input into how both of those uh, flows of inf information get tokenized and turned into machine learning, machine readable information systems, as opposed to the tokenization strategies that are really kind of maybe not as interesting or as nuanced. And of course, the discussion was constantly revolving around how that tokenization process could be informed by all of the conversations that we were having across the week and that you saw kind of a sampling of tonight. Um, so that was a really hard start. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I can't thank David enough. It was an incredible, incredible week. Also, Alvaro, yes, David, David, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Alvar Alvaro Domain was supposed to join us via Zoom, and I, 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 I'm not even sure if he was able to because we barely got it set up at the start. But in any case, Alvaro is an extraordinary, originally from Madrid, guitarist, composer, um, teacher in New York, uh, one of the most brilliant guitarists, young guitarists, in my opinion, anywhere today, not just the States. Uh, and I hope that you get a chance to hear Alvaro Domain at some point when he's back in Madrid. We did rehearse two days ago with Alvaro Perez, the great saxophone player who is based here in Madrid. Uh, so just to stump for both of the Alvaros, I hope you get to hear both Alvaro Perez and Alvaro Domain when they come and play in, in Madrid again. Um, the only other thing I'll say about gesture is I think David and I had some really beautiful conversations about looking back in a way at Brian Eno's oblique strategies and many other ways that we could approach even a short hit like this to, to ch try to imagine what it would mean to have a constraint set, a library of gestures that would both have something to do with the way we approach our instruments, something to do with the way that the instruments make sound, and something to do with the way that we're thinking about the formation of cognitive patterns, both as musicians and as people, as people with bodies that move. Um, and so we did have a nice li a laundry list. I don't think we stuck to it very rigorously right now, but you know we had a nice laundry, laundry list of gestures that we used in rehearsals over the past couple of days. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for sticking around. Yeah. Thank you. yeah.